I'm Ryan Malone, and you're missing curfew with the boys. <laughs> Fellas, our boys at DraftKings are up to it again, up dog. These guys are everywhere, and I love it. They're always up to no good, aren't they, fellas? Competing for the goal with DraftKings. DraftKings free-to-play pools are available every day of the games in Tokyo and offering free shot at up to $5,000 in total cash prizes. Boys, that's 5 k total up for grabs, as the best part of it is it's free to play, big fella, big fella. DraftKings free-to-play pools are easy to enter. Just download the DraftKings app, go to pools, and choose from a wide variety of free contests for an opportunity to win cash prizes. All you have to do is answer a handful of questions around what you think is going to happen during that day's events and track your results through the evening to see if you'll end up on the podium. Questions will range from medal count to questions specific on the U.S. team. DraftKings is safe, secure, and reliable, so you can deposit and withdraw your money at your convenience, Scoopsy. Download the top-rated DraftKings app now and use promo code CURFEWKINGS when you sign up to get your free shot at up to $5,000 in total cash prizes every day of the gold medal games. Head to DraftKings Pools page to get your shot at huge cash prizes. That's promo code CURFEWKINGS for a limited time only at DraftKings. Eligibility restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com for full details. Curfew Kings. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to a fresh new episode of Missing Curfew. I'm Shane O'Brien coming to you from Hall Pass Media in beautiful Newport Beach. And I am Scotty Upshaw Lobes. I'm here in Sag Harbor at beautiful Kevin Shattenkirk's nice crib with the family. Uh, life's beautiful, but always a pleasure to be jumping on with you boys again for our nice weekly update. And I'm Jimmy Broadway Scoops Hayes, man of a million nicknames back on the East Coast, boys. The weather is sucked here. Up dogs, nice to have you on the East Coast. Maybe I can figure out one of those uh, Discovery Land projects and get a private bird out to the Hamptons with you. <laughs> Come on down, my man. Come on down. Broadway, what's up, baby? Let's start with you. You've taken some heat. And listen, I'll give you credit. You fucking took it like a man. You were on a cold streak from hell. People started going against you, fading you. But buddy, as we say in the NHL, you're only as good as your last shift. And for you, you're only as good as your last bet, baby. And it was a winner, winner chicken dinner. It sure was. It's a what have you done for me lately type league. <laughs> and I sure hope no one fucking faded me because you know what? I'm back, boys. I'm back. I'm one and oh in my last one bet. So let's go, baby. <laughs> Hazy, I, if you had that sort of record throughout your season, though, in, in your career, you'd be sitting up in the stands fucking quicker <laughs> than you could even quicker than you can think. But hey, <laughs> Italy, boys. I, oh, I streamed it, yeah. too. I absolutely oh. hammered them. I got to live bet before the shootout, Hazy. I had them second half. Second half paid out huge. Plus 245 to, to win the second half. And as they went on, they, they obviously scored the goal, right? 1-1. Yeah. And I'm thinking, okay, do they, in the middle of my bet, you know how soccer bets are just so whack sometimes? Like, they win, but do they lift the trophy? So I'm sitting there, and I'm like, do they need to actually win the game in, in regulation right now, or do they just need to win the half? So it's... Soon as that 90 minutes got up and, and extra time and they went to the, you know, to the extra time, I'm, I'm checking, I'm updating, updating. <laughs> then it showed me with the victory for the, you know, for the one, one match. And, and then boy, did I double it down in that shootout. What a lovely, what a lovely bet though, Scoopsy. Good job. Though. I oh, took, thanks, I w. took Italy at the start of the tournament boys for the Caribbean, yeah. Caribbean family. And my boy, Daniel, who I do sports that he's a big Italian guy. I text Daniel. I'm like, does Italy have a chance to win this? He's like, yeah, they do. I got him at like plus 600. And then wow. I took him, yeah. And then I took him heading into the last little group stage. So I ended up winning like 10k in that game. And I'm on the plane. We're Let's sitting on the go. we're sitting on the runway going from Vegas back home. Obviously, there's a million fucking planes leaving, so we're sitting there for an hour and a half. And I'm watching on the plane with the boys. And when that Italy guy had the last kick to win it, and he and he didn't score, I was like, that's it. I'm done. There's no way I'm gonna win, right? Like, sure enough, they look like me taking the shootout Broadway. I was like, aren't these guys oh supposed God. to be the who are the sharpshooters for fucking England here? I couldn't believe it, but like that's that goes to show you this whole uh, Euro Cup. There, there were so many saves like during penalty shots during the games. But at least you can go bury the rebound, which I think is the craziest rule in soccer. The goalie makes a save, <laughs> then he gets lit up on the rebound. That should not happen. But I was completely shocked. 
to see three saves in the shootout. That is nuts to me. It never Boys, can we talk about just how big a mutants the British fans were oh, outside yeah. that they partied for 48 hours before that game. I think Friday morning they had 5 a.m. They were at the bar. 5 a.m. They were starting it at the bar. Was, it was absolutely absurd. My boy Mac Daddy, Mac L, sent me a video before the before the game of this crazy, this crazy hooligan out there. And he had the Tootskis going and he was in front of everyone, just whoa bam. And you're like, they are they are absolutely on fire over there. Like I'm so, <laughs> the guy was with the loss. Hollywood? Oh yeah, it was oh. it was absurd. I gotta sh- I'll show you the video off off site. Oh, no, it I, was, I uh, saw the video. It was an absolute uh, victory for the Italians. Man, I went for some Italian takeout after the two, and it it was tasty. Just oh. just because I enjoyed that win with some uh, chicken parm long as my arm, a little rigatoni boys, and some nice bread. Boy, it was a nice time. I saw I saw one English fan with a firecracker up his ass, fucking bent over. I was like, <laughs> Jesus Christ. This was after they lost. But uh, yeah, Italy, good on you. Thanks for fucking getting the boys. I needed that. That got me back to even from fucking Montreal and Vegas, Broadway. That's all it did, basically. Uh, yeah. I, 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 I've been betting like the biggest chicken shit better, uh, probably on planet Earth because of how, how bad of that streak I went on. So I'm still in the <laughs> hole. So I'm, I was thinking about betting on the fucking home run derby last night. And thank God I didn't bloody because I was going to take that Gallo guy and he got fucking bounced <laughs> in the first round. I was like, Oh my God, I dodged the bullet there, boys. That would have been fucking embarrassing. Broadway. I was going to take, uh, the big, uh, Asian guys, uh, Otani. I was going to yeah. take Otani, but Otani. my site, I couldn't figure it out how to like bet him just to win. It was per pure, uh, Per round, yeah, matchups, and he lost in the yeah. first round too. So I thank God that's just a sign of Obi quit betting, you dumb fuck. So, uh, <laughs> boys, real quick, I was at the McGregor fight, and obviously, you know, we talked about to Chuck, and, and the shit hit the fan. And Broadway, I was I was waiting for the elevator with Loops and Macal, and I hear like Obs, Obs, and I see like two big guys, and then I, I'm like, fuck, that's Keith to Chuck, and then sure enough, it was Keith, Matt, and Brady. So Matt's like, come over here, Obs. I've never met I've never met him, Broadway, and he's like, he's like. Oh, great what, kid. what great kid. He goes, what the fuck did you say? I'm like, dude, I he's like, I wo- I'm like, why? He's like, I woke up whatever the day that was. My Twitter account was going bananas. People from Calgary telling me I'm a fucking trader. I've asked for a trade. I'm like, Matt, I never, I never said you asked for a trade. I said, if Tarasenko got moved and they could somehow get you, it would be a great fit. You'd be a great St. Louis blue. And uh, I turned to his dad. I go, I hope he's not pissed off. And his dad's like, nah, nah, nah. Are you kidding me? He loves the press. The guy loves you. <laughs> and then Matt, him and his brother Brady had two big beers going. And he's like, yeah, there's no such thing as bad press, right? Hope so. Um, great kids. That Brady to Chuck boys is a monster. 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 Like 6'4". Wait until he grows into that body. It's going to be unbelievable. So uh, yeah, another yeah, great. They're just, they're just kids, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's crazy up how big they are. So great family. Big Walt, beauty. Um Uppy, you you did touch on this last week, and I just I want to touch on it real quick because I've been hard on NBC a lot, and they did a thing after Game Five, Doc Emmerich. It was fucking unbelievable. They went through every era when Sid came in the league, our era, Uppy and Ovi, and then passing the torch to McDavid and the start of the Winter Classic and the Stadium Series and the in between the glass, um, you know the Olympic stuff they covered. I, I just want to say first of all, Doc Emmerich, that was a great way to send off NBC, and and you know what they did a lot of good for hockey boys and. When I saw that, it made me realize that I've been hard on them a lot lately. So, uh, to NBC, congratulations! Thanks for everything. Uh, I do still think it's time for a change, but that was a great send off. And they and boys, they did a lot for hockey through the course of their contract. Obi, well said. I, I just want to touch on this because you and I were playing the league this time, Obs, and I often see old highlights of of teams I played on, and and I see in the corner it says versus. Yeah. And think about what our TV was like when we had versus. I mean, you had friends in Canada couldn't watch a game. You had people. I mean, sure, Obi and Loops are in are in Australia on vacation <laughs> trying to find what channel versus would be on. I mean, it's nearly impossible. What NBC did, boys, when they came in and and granted they had this opportunity to really take hockey to the next level, and I think they did. Eddie Olchuk, hell of a job. And Brian so- Boucher coming in in between the glass. Great job. A good young player that that should transition into media right away and, and did an incredible job of sharing just the excitement of hockey in those big moments. Um, for, for me, they got the Sidney Crosby, Alex Ovechkin era. You know, some of these guys are, are generational players, boys. Some of the best players to ever put on skates. Doc Emmerich was able to call, you know, three Stanley Cups for Sidney Crosby. One Stanley Cup for Alex Ovechkin. I mean, th- this is something that we'll look back on in, in years and years to come. And our kids will be watching these highlights and listening to these voices and, and you know, the transition of the game. And, and 
what they said about the winter classic boys and, and how they, you know, all of a sudden we're playing hockey in stadiums and there's jets flying over our game. And, yeah. and we, we make this winter wonderland for, for families to go and experience hockey in baseball stadiums and football stadiums. Truly amazing. So well done, NBC. It's a send off. That's that, you know, we, we have ripped you. Thanks for setting the, the round table. Obi loves a good I, round table with the I, guys I, when you're sitting there. It's about time. Um, I ripped great send off. Obi, well said. Uh, but but touch on it, boys. Just what, what do you think, Hazy? No, no, you guys just did a, a hell of a job uh, touching on breaking it down. NBC did for the game, and they got they got lucky. They got two of the best players in the world to come into the league with Crosby and Ovechkin, and they did a hell of a job. But just like anything, you know, time runs its course. And, you know, at ESPN, TNT, that's the those are the big names in the market right now. And they do a hell of a job at branding and growing the game. And I just can't wait to see what they can do with the NHL because I think that's what's going to get the NHL to the next level fan-wise. Just keep being able to have these conversations, getting new faces into the into the studios and doing the, you know, the, the hot stoves with the fellas. And I think uh, ESPN has a great cast coming. And I'm, I'm looking forward to see how the NHL is going to continue to grow. I think, boys, NBC's job they did set the tone for why ESPN wanted to come back and grab hockey, yeah. why TNT wanted to experiment and grab hockey and spend a lot of money to do it. And, and, and those, you know, those those segments uh, that Doc was able to do, uh, you know, these special videos, watching Connor McDavid, you know, come up as an 18, 19 year old kid and now win three heart trophies. It's I don't know if he's won three heart trophies. I just threw that out there. But anyway, <laughs> I, I think he's won two. Goes. I think he's won two. <laughs> I think he's one. Too. Uh, he will win. Boys, it's dollars. just it, it's an incredible time for our sport. We're trying to expand it daily with our podcast, with our fan base. Same thing with ESPN. Same thing with TNT. But w- without without NBC really stepping up over the last 10, 12 years and doing what they did, I, I don't know if our game would be where it's at. You know, a lot to our players, but more so on on just everyone involved, people behind the scenes, and and it was a, it was truly a special way to send off. I, I know. I actually sent Catherine Tappen a message too. I've known her for forever, but I sent her a DM because I listened to the way she talked to Patrick Sharp and Anson Carter and the boys on the panel and Jonesy. And it was like, man, this is the last time these people are going to, you know, have a show together. And wow. they've been, they've been through the the thickets for forever. So um, just congratulations to all of them and, and the best with their, you know, whatever they do in the future, but it was well done. It was very well done. Fucking. I forgot about versus up my rookie year. I was living up at the, by the Honda center. So I was living in this hotel room. Randy Carlisle made me stay there for four months, which he thought would keep me out of Newport beach. But all it really did was keep me <laughs> in taxis back and forth from Newport. But anyways, I would go to the, uh, that Schmidt's bar beside the errors in the Honda center and try to get a hockey game. And I couldn't get one. I'm like, hey, can you put on the, the Flyers game? Like, oh, sorry, we don't get it. So it's a great point by you, Uppy. It's come a long way. And to ESPN and TNT, I think Steger had a great point a couple weeks ago. Make it a debate. You know, in between periods, let guys really debate. And Uppy, it brings me to my next question. I want to start with you because you played for this guy and you know him better than me in Broadway. But they asked Charles Barkley on the TNT, the match. Barkley said a lot of people have been asking him, and he asked Wainer this, Uppy. Wayne, will you be able to criticize NHL players or are you just too good of a guy? Like basically saying, Charles was saying, you hockey players are too good of guys. You don't criticize players. And that's what the people want ups. I seen him criticize every referee in the NHL. <laughs> so I know he can criticize a guy from, from the TNT studio. There's no question. No, but I, I also want to say, you know, make it a debate one thing, but make it a conversation, make it a conversation. That's just real. And maybe that means the guys have a little Yeti cooler with a, you know, a little red wine in there or something that's, you know, a little missing curfew Yeti cooler or something that, where they just get to be open and they say things that they would normally say, whether they're sitting in a bar with, with a buddy of theirs from high school, or they're, you know, sitting in the coach's office and having to explain to the coach why, you know, why I turned the puck over. And so getting into these minds and these personalities, Obi, I think that's where you're coming from is, is hockey needs it. Hockey needs more of open-mindedness of people allowing, you know, fans to dive into what it's really like to think like a hockey guy, but to be a real person at the same time and not just be this like, you know, cliche guy, allow them to ask weird questions, allow them during the intermission to talk about weird things, things that are, things that are more real life than just, you know, blue lines, red lines and rebounds. Um, so, so I, I, I don't know. I think it's a great opportunity. I think they did a hell of a job with, with Messier, Chelios, 
you know, having Gretz, that's like a pretty, that's an all-star lineup. And I, oh, yeah. I really feel that they're only hazy. I really feel that they're only beginning with their personalities. They're going to see how these guys work and then they're going to have an opportunity to add and build like chemistry. Cause those shows don't just get created overnight. No. Um, and, and, and that's exciting for the game too. And for fans, I mean, we, we have, we have an exciting time coming back from COVID filling up arenas next year, Canada, letting everyone in. And you know, it's, it's, it's going to start with tuning into ESPN, tuning into TNT and, and watching like a weekly show with Gretzky and these boys on it's, it's going to be great. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think they, they did a great job in getting personalities like Gretzky, Chelios and Messier. And I think Wayne, he actually answered that question pretty funny. He was like, yeah, I can chirp these guys from my couch, so I should be able to do it on TV. <laughs> so I think Wayne will be able to do it. And you know what? Those three names are some of the most respected names in hockey. And I think hockey players, that we can take the bad press. Like if you, if you're, it's, it's your job to play well. So if you're not playing well and they're talking about you not playing well, that's going to light a fire under a lot of these kids' asses, especially if Wayne Gretzky's – if I was playing and Wayne Gretzky told me I need to pick the fucking – pick my game up, I'm fucking staying in a couple more nights this week, and I'm picking my fucking game up. So I think it's great for this. And I think TNT and ESPN, that's – it's a no-brainer for them. And that's what this uh, uh, hockey broadcast needs. You need honesty in, you know, the opinions. and They're like assholes. Everyone's got them, so just fucking run with it. Or you're going out a couple nights even harder to play a little more guilty. Hey, I'll wait until me. I'll fuck it. I'm gonna play. Problem. I'm Oops. gonna play a little. I'm gonna go out a little harder, play a little more guilty to get me going here. You, you would have stayed in, would you? Come on. Yeah. Or, or you just get in a huge Twitter war with Gretzky. Like, <laughs> oh yeah, Gretz. Oh, yeah. yeah that, you wouldn't have done that, huh? You wouldn't have went out the night before. That and would then, get my know, follower up Brandon and, up. That'd be fucking huge for me. <laughs> I, I agree. I, I think they should let the red wine flow, but um, it'll be interesting, boys. And, and good days ahead for the NHL and TNT and ESPN. Great job couple hires there, ESPN, a couple suspect hires, but we'll get into that once the season starts. Um, boys, big news yesterday. Uh, it's the start of the offseason. Duncan Keith, uh, we talked about last week. It was between Edmonton and Seattle. He goes to the Edmonton Oilers for Caleb Jones, a third and a fourth round pick. So, Updog, we'll start with you because you do an Edmonton radio show. A lot of people up in Edmonton are upset with that Edmonton took all of Duncan Keith's salary. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Do you think it's a good fit? I know it's not Duncan Keith, 27 years old, but he can still move his feet up. He can still move his feet up. Yeah, I listen, I think there was a lineup of teams that would have taken Duncan Keith. I don't know if they would have taken the salary with it, um, you know, and ate all the salary. But what I see is, is Edmonton needing this, like, just big time. They're, they're in, like, what do we need? And we need defensemen. We need guys that can help younger players. they got a lot of youth. Duncan Keith has proved he can still play. He's not the Duncan Keith 10 years ago. He's not the Duncan Keith five years ago. But he can still probably play 18 to 20 minutes a night. He can pass that. He can put it in the right place. He can put that puck in the right place, which is what Tyson Berry did all year long. Um, you know, but for me, it's it's a little sign of like, you know, this is desperation. This is a team that needs needs help on the back end. Who Great knows point. who they're going to lose in the expansion draft? Um, you know, Darnell Nurse can't be playing 30 minutes a night in the playoffs. You're not going to win. And quite frankly, Duncan Keith is a guy that that can even help the likes of Darnell Nurse and help the likes of, of Ethan Bear. And, and these young kids will look up to him. The guy's got two Norris trophies, three, three, Stanley, blah, 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 three Stanley Cups. It's like, <laughs> how, how do you not look at that guy and be, and, and be like, hey, you know what? I'm going to learn from this guy. I'm going to play well with him if I get the chance to be on the ice with him. And that that will feed off through throughout their team. Um, I know Tippett, and I know the way he plays. I know how, what he demands in his players, and he's going to love the fact that Duncan Keith is in his dressing room wearing a letter, uh, having that experience. And and I, I think overall, it's a great move by Kenny Holland. Yeah, I agree, Uppy. I think it's. Uh, I think both teams win in this situation. If I mean, if not, we can't pick a winner yet. I think Chicago wins by not having to take any of that salary. But if they were to take any of that salary that trade gets a little more crazier for Edmonton. Now, obviously they're going to add some more pieces to that trade and the Edmonton Oilers. What do they need? When you look at their team, they need defensemen, they need proven winners and they need leadership, more leadership in that room. I mean, they got great guys with McDavid and dry but you need a veteran presence there. So I, I mean, it's, it's a place where Duncan Keith wanted to go, which I thought was crazy. I thought nobody wanted to go to Edmonton, but Duncan <laughs> Keith proved me wrong. And, and now it's just making me look like a genius that the Chicago Blackhawks got uh, Caleb Jones because I think uh, Seth Jones's phone's gonna be ringing this week, boys. It's gonna be ringing. Uh, yeah, I got that. I got that in the I got that in the Good Life Rumor Roll segment, Broadway. I, I got you teed up for that, fellow. We'll get right into that. 
for me, listen, I saw Kenny Holland do an interview this morning, and they were basically, the guy was asking him, like, uh, you know, you, get, you gave up a third and fourth, you took all his salary, like, you could have, Kenny Holland was like, would you want me to get him for free? Like, I had to give up something to get this guy. So, for me, the salary, I get it because of the flat cap, but, but Edmonton has some cap space, I believe. For me, it's if you could bring in a three-time Stanley Cup champ, two-time Olympic gold medalist, Conn Smythe, Norris Trophy, to come in and help Connor and Dreisaitl, all these guys in the dressing room, for me, that's the biggest asset to this older squad up being Broadway. And then he can still play. He can play 15 to 20 yes. minutes. He can move his feet. He'll be better defensively. They're going to lose Tyson Berry, it looks like, so... Um, time will tell, but if I'm an Oilers fan, Updog, I'm excited about this, bringing in a Duncan Keith. I know he's 37 or 38 years old, but he's still a legit NHL 37. defenseman. 37, yeah. Boys, uh, I'll, and, and I'll touch on this, Jimmy, to your point. I would have done anything to play for the Edmonton Oilers at, at the last part of my career. I, I went in <laughs> yeah, with one here. fucking leg. I went in with one <laughs> leg to try to make that damn team. Fucking, I think this is a great opportunity for Duncan Keith to have some closure to his career. Not And not like you're going to Florida and you're just going to sail away in, in yeah. Boca and play some golf. He has a chance <laughs> to play with the best players in the world. And in a great hockey city that is dying for a winning season. And I mean, you know, there's a lot of pressure that comes with that. But he's been a Chicago Blackhawk. He knows what it's all about. It's it's a great opportunity to be around his son, his family. You know, he lives in he lives down in, in Penticton, which is a beautiful house couple hours of flight away. Um, it's just, it works for everybody. I'm happy to see Canada get a, you know, get a Hall of Fame player. And, uh, you know, let's just hope the Oilers can do something with it. I agree. Up here to the Oilers fans up there. I wouldn't be worried about the salary. It's not your money. It's not your fucking money. Yeah. Just worry about if this guy helps your team <laughs> hey, or not. Hey, ups. Where the fuck are they getting this money from, by the way? Too? Uh, I, I, did they just have an extra five and a half bananas to just throw around right now? I, I think they're I think they're in some I think they're in some okay cap room. If we could pull it up on cap friendly, let's look. James Neal is a is a buyout guy too that's name popped up. So he might be see you later. He's gonna be fucking see you later, isn't he? Uh, Hold on here. I'd be let shocked me, if he wasn't. Let me look at their team here, boys. Whoops. Projected cap space, 11 and a half million. So that, boys, in this fucking season is a lot of cap space for a team. Yeah. So they got a little bit of room up to maneuver. Um, yeah. I, I get it, though. Seriously, I, I if it would have been nice if Chicago retained some of his salary because the Hawks have tons of cap space, right, Broadway? They have, like, ridiculous. They're down amount. the bottom of it. Who are I they? Know, they got 11. Sheet. They right got 11 now, million. They're, they're in the top 10 for cap space. They got 11 million, Chicago. Yeah. So. I don't know. I think, I mean, anytime you can bring a Duncan Keith into your dressing room, I know he's a little long in the tooth, but we'll see how it works out. For the Oilers fans, I hope it does work out because you got the best player on the planet and getting swept four straight just isn't good enough. So, uh, boys, Pekka Rene, one of my, I only played with him for a year, but fuck, I'm going to start this one off. He retires today. Uh, I'll be one of my favorite guys I ever played with. Made it fun to come to the rink every morning. Um, you know, there was lots of mornings where we do penalty kill and, and Webbs is whipping one-timers and Hornquist is in front of the net. And I'm just like, I don't want no part of this. And you feed off Pex's energy. One of the best goalies I ever played in front of. Um, he did so much in that community up. He, he was one of the best teammates. It's a hell of a career. He didn't have the playoff success he wanted to, but um, to Pex, a hell of a career, buddy. And uh, I'm sure he'll have a job in Nashville whenever he wants one A-ups. He'll have a job anywhere, Obi. Um a guy that's going to be in the front office, a guy that could be either a goaltending coach all the way to an assistant GM. Um, Pekka Rene, I remember him coming over in probably 2004 uh, during the lockout and this big, tall, goofy Finn didn't speak a lick of <laughs> English, but loved, lo loved to be with the boys, loved to hang out, always, always in a good mood. I mean, the guy could have got peppered for seven or eight goals, never, never did. But would just would just come in and be like, ah, it's on me, boys, and and you know, I'll put it behind me. Let's go have some beers. A teammate through and through. Um, you know, I, I remember when I left Nashville, he was one of the first guys that like you know came to my room, wished me the best, uh, then asked me to rent rent my condo out the next season. <laughs> so I'm like, absolutely, buddy, you take her all you want. Um, so you know, hell of a career, Obes. Got a Vesna, sixty shutouts. I mean. Yeah. The guy, the guy did it all. So a legend. Congrats, Pex, uh, from the boys here at Missing Curfew. Love to have you on anytime when you get back from uh, from the fucking from the cold north. So anyway, have a career and he, and well done, Nashville. Well done, Pex. He had the best yeah. laugh. You just talked about his smile. He had the best laugh. Remember his laugh? It was just like that. That finish. Like I can't really do it, but he always had a smile on his face. 
And as a defenseman playing in front of him, he would catch every puck, boys. Like, if it was over here, he'd catch it. Over here, he'd catch it. <laughs> um, he was just an unbelievable athlete, great guy. Always had a smile on his face and always had a chew-in. If he wasn't playing, he had that finished chew-in all day long. Um, so to Pekka Rene, congrats, buddy. Great run. Um, one of my favorite teammates. I know Updog thinks the same way. Broadway, we'll start with you. Big news this morning. I got up. I was having a little, you know, a little shower, having a coffee, and boom. Wild buyout. Ryan Suter and Zach Parisi. God. Now, listen, boys. Before I turn over Broadway, I, I get the Parisi one. The, the Suter one surprised yeah. a little bit. Suti was a big part of their back end. Now, I know it opens up cap space, but Hazy, what were your thoughts on, on this right away? Uh, my thoughts were exactly what you just said, Obes. Suter, like, that one shocked me. Parisi, not so much. He was starting to become a healthy scratch. They need to find some cap space to sign uh, the the Kirill and then uh, Kevin Fiala. Um, so I think the Prezi makes sense, but Suter to me, the team was very, very good this year. It overachieved probably from the start. They probably weren't a playoff team. They make the playoffs. He's a big piece of it. So to buy out a guy and then have to pay him for the next eight years, both of these guys, almost $7 million a year to not play for you. I think that's <laughs> nuts. I, 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 I didn't see Suter. I saw Prezi, but uh, I mean, Suter's going to be the happiest guy in the world. He's going to make 6.87 million bucks to sit on his couch and actually not sit on his couch. Someone else is going to sign him. So he's going to, he's going to be swimming in it. Fuck the rich get richer. It's crazy. Uppy, you, had a, Uppy, you had a good, you had a good, you had a good topic on this, right? Why they bought them both out. Yeah. And, and I want to get into it, but I just, well, first off, I want to, re- you guys remember, like we were, we were in Florida, Hazy. I remember July 1st hearing that these two guys signed these, you know, 13 year deals worth. Yeah hundreds of bananas and i'm yeah. like what is happening in this world like i and obes you and i played with suits but it's like all of a sudden you're like these two guys both matching 13 year 98 million dollar deals and i knew craig leopold he was my owner when i was in nashville we weren't exactly throwing around cash like it was going out of style but this was like a this was a monumental contract signing for both of these guys in in the nhl i think it'll go down as signing two of the biggest you know, contracts in one spot ever, yeah. um, you know, and to me, uh, you know, to touch on Obi, your, your question, and, and we spoke about this before, it didn't make sense to buy out just one guy. It made sense for them to get all this cap relief and buy both out at the same time and just reset, you know, yes, Suter probably can play out the rest of this, but you know, right yeah. now before the expansion draft, before this all happens, Let's just clear the books. Uh, so much relief in years two and then way more in three and four. Um, you know, right now, and and I, I put a note here that, you know, had this pandemic not a hit and the cap continued to rise and rise and rise, they wouldn't have had to think about buying out these guys right now. They probably would have been like, ah, let's give them another year. You know, we got room, um, especially Suter. So when, when this flat cap all of a sudden the last two years hits and it's supposed to stay flat for who knows you know how much longer, they're forced to make really tough decisions. Organizations are all forced to do this, and and things aren't the way it was ten years ago when they're just going to offer you know two guys hundred million dollars yeah. deals each. So um, you know th- the way we're living right now and the times we're in are the reasons why these guys are no longer Minnesota Wild and. You know, it's it's nothing against them. They both had great careers. I wish them both the best. I hope they work on their golf game. I wouldn't care to play a fucking another game. <laughs> if, I, if I was getting fucking 40 million to just almost sit 50 there, million. Yeah, boys, whatever it is. I don't know. I would but focus, they don't they don't they both uh, don't, don't they both don't have a cup though. Ups. I know what you're saying there, but if you didn't have a cup, would you probably, you know, you want to give it I mean Ryan Suter. Ryan Suter. Listen, July 28th, free agency. I guarantee every team is going to try to get Suitsy because, like you just said, Broadway, he's going to make so much money. He'll probably sign for one year or whatever, one or two million dollars, right? Like, yeah. A team will be lining up for him. Where's that at? I don't know. Is it fucking, if, if Vegas Detroit? loses if Vegas loses Alex Martinez, is it Vegas for a million dollars? Do you go to Vegas? I mean, they're not going to be able to. Philadelphia Flyers are looking for a defenseman. Philadelphia Flyers. I mean, Martinez is not going to be able to sign in Vegas because if they still have Flurry. Right, unless he wants to take a big time yeah. discount, but Philly, I mean, there's going to be teams that want Ryan Suter. Austin, and, and, Obes, you know, and you know, Suits Obes, is he going to play for a million bucks or is he going to want four? Yeah, it's a good point. I don't know. Does he want to win that bad or is he like, you know, it's a 
I don't know. Are there teams out there right now that you know are going to be, you know, in the Stanley Cup finals? Like, you know, probably not. Colorado. I mean, Colorado would be a great place for him Colorado to land, too. Great- I, I just don't think if he's a guy that's going to be like, you know what, I got 45, 48 million bucks coming in, I'll sign somewhere for 80 million grand. reasons not to play. Yeah. I no, mean, no, no. I, I, I agree with Obi. He's going to play. Yeah, he's I, did. Too, I do too. He's too good. He's a hockey creature. He's been, yeah, he's he been a natural it. hockey he player his whole right life. Boys. He's too good. And Zach Parise is going to play too. Who are we kidding? He's he's he will stand in front of any goalie and be effective for seven hundred grand on any team. But sometimes it's like a little tough pill to swallow and realize you got to go play in a new team. And um, you know these guys thought they were going to be franchisees. They, yeah, uh, you know it's it's heartbreaking blow to what just happened today. Yeah. But you know we'll we'll see we'll see where these guys end up. But it's um, it's crazy. To get that, all that money and not play another game, the Bobby Bonilla effect here. It's crazy. I, will, <laughs> I will say about Suitsy, I don't think when you ask will he play for a million bucks, two million, I think he will because he's a farm boy. He goes back to Wisconsin in the summertime and works the farm. I mean, he has enough money to last him two times, like whatever, 10 lives, whatever you want to say. But I think he will want to play and try to win a Stanley Cup. And for me, per easy up dog, I got him down here as fucking, I think he might have to go on a PTO up dog style. He might have to go there. <laughs> oh, fucking, man. He may no have way to that guy him. goes on a PTO. He no way to go Zach Preezy goes on a PTO. You don't think so? He's not taking my name, though. He's not taking <laughs> Mr. PTO. He can be whatever the fuck he wants. So, <laughs> Broad, Broadway, you think somebody offers him one year 750 on July 28th or into August, right? You think somebody will give him a one-year deal? Yes, yes. Okay. I, it, it's, it's deciding the factor will be, does he want to play for that money? Like, like you said, they have so much money, but if they want to play – and that's the type of contract offer they're getting. They're getting. There's no way they're not getting PTOs. Guys like Jimmy Hayes go on PTOs, not Zach Preezy and Ryan Suter. Fuck Preezy has Preezy had as many goals as you last year as you did in Boston. You could put Preezy in the same fucking. <laughs> he's not exact. Highest, not, paid, highest hey, paid player point point, buddy. I love it. Welcome to the club. He's not Zach Preezy of the, when, what we're thinking of, boys. When he played against us, I know that I played against that Zach. No, Preezy. but that his guy, name speaks for itself. Yeah, maybe. Well, that's someone's giving him a deal. Yeah, you're probably right, Broadway. You're probably right. So, Suitsy, Preezy, I mean, life's still good. Boys, you got that cheddar coming in. And listen, lots of good players get bought out, Suitsy. Shake it off, buddy. Um, the good life Look rumor mill. The good life rumor mill, baby. This got some good traction last week, boys. So, Vladdy Tarasenko, we're going to pump our own tires here first. Up, me and you broke the news before everyone. We didn't get the love on Twitter, but we did break it first. And then Jacob Voracek. So, Uppy, let's start with you with Vladdy. There's rumors New York Islanders. They're saying, like, it, maybe it's going to be a bad contract for a bad contract. Well, how do you think Vladdy gets moved up, dog? Or, or, or is New York Islanders a good fit for him? Well, I think right now it's like, you know, you leave him unprotected. Does does Seattle take him? Probably not. So you got to find a way to move him to get any sort of value. He's still an incredible goal scorer. And teams need goal scoring. Look at Las Vegas Golden Knights. Should they have put three or four pucks in the net in the power play, they'd probably advance and make it to the Stanley Cup Finals. Great point. Um, So does the Vegas Golden Knights turn into the St. Louis Blues of the desert? I mean, with Petro, Revo, and now Vladdy. I mean, those guys were were pretty tight guys. You know, they're probably – I have no question in my mind that Vegas is sitting down with Revo right now and asking him, like, you know, how how important could Vladdy be on our team and would he buy in and and asking Petro the same questions. I think that that's a a conversation that's going on in a lot of organizations right now. What do we think of Vladdy Tarasenko? Is he healthy? Can he still score 25 to 30 goals and help us win? And the fact that he's asking for a trade now out of St. Louis, who's been very generous to Vladdy and who just won a Stanley Cup with them – He's now asking for a trade. Yeah, but so Uppy, what? Yeah, let me let me jump no, in there. Let me jump in there real quick. Uppy, no, let me sorry. jump in there real quick. Uppy, we had Strickland on yesterday, and Strickland said that Tarasenko was pissed off about the way the trainers yeah. and doctors handled the shoulder yep. surgery. That's what I was just gonna say. Now, That's what I was just gonna say. Dan. You dealt with something similar in St. Louis like that, right? Or is, does he have a right? Like you know the trainers there. Does that shit happen in St. Louis? Yeah. That's exactly what I was going to say, Obes. You guys are fucking teeing me up for this right now, aren't you? Because you, <laughs> you know exactly, both of you know exactly how I feel. And I, well, I'm just throwing this out there as topics of conversation that other teams are going to have. Now, I'm glad, deep down, I'm happy that Vladdy came out and said this. Because not many players come out and say that the way they're handled, you know, personally. And I, I watched Vladdy go through his first shoulder three surgery. Three surgeries, three surgeries. I watched, yes. listen, I watched it. I watched it firsthand. I watched the moment... He came into the dressing room with the sling on to how he 
you know, did his first surgery and then wasn't allowed to see certain people to get extra treatment. And it had to be this way and that way and this way. And listen to the doctors. Sometimes it's not right, boys. In the NHL, sometimes it's not right. Now, Vladdy Tarasenko is one of the purest goal scorers of, of, of my generation that I got to watch firsthand. In practice, he has the craziest laser beam wrist shot that you've seen. Teams need that. But teams need a healthy Vladdy Tarasenko. Yeah. So he needs to come in and prove that, you know, I got two years left at, at 7 Point eight million bucks, and I'm going to help your team win. And by that, I mean I'm going to back check. I'm going to buy in. I'm going to I work with my line mates. I'm not going to. There's a lot of things about Vladdy that I'm going to mix in a salad. You know, I'm going to mix in a salad. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm going to. He needs to mix in a few salads. Oh, hey, all those Russians are thick boys, though. You see those Russians on the other than other than Vasilevsky, those boys are thick on those boats. <laughs> Yeah, well, that Kucherov, he looked like he's been he's been on the beer diet for a while, but God damn it, he's the best hockey player on the planet right now. Uh, listen, Vladdy, to me, is going to go to a team that's going to give him opportunity to play with great players and to shoot the puck. But he needs to know that he can't just go in and, and think that it's going to be easy. He needs to be in shape. He needs to be healthy. He needs to come in with, a, a, with that attitude that I know he has. I see it in his eyes sometimes. Um, and then Vladdy Tarasenko is an asset to you winning a Stanley Cup. If he if he tiptoes around what he thinks is fine, then he's not. Um, and and I just I just hope Vladdy at this age, you know, he's getting up there. Injuries are taking its toll. He has another chance to get a new start somewhere. I hope he makes the best of it. And knowing how big of a competitor he is, I think he will. So, yeah. um, you know, we'll see where we'll see where his eggs fall. But to me, the healthy in shape. Vicious fucking attitude. Vladdy Tarasenko is is uh, is a pickup and a great one for any team that's involved. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, I think he he needs to go to an environment where they demand that type of uh, attitude and preparation for a game. Because, like you said, up he he hasn't been healthy these last whatever amount of seasons are with these surgery uh, shoulder surgeries, and that's obviously going to play a toll on him physically and then mentally. And then he's going home and he's dealing with this bullshit that he doesn't want to be dealing with. He wants to get the, the help that he wants. It seems like they both kind of just run the course and it's time to move on from one another. And a team like the Islanders underneath the guy like Lou Lamorello, who's going to make sure that you're showing up, you got to be in shape and ready to go. That could be a perfect fit for him, be able to play with a guy like Barzell to get, feed him pucks and use that shot that he has. I mean, I think that's a great move for the, the New York Islanders to pursue Tarasenko. I just don't know what the Islanders are going to have to give up to get him. I, I, I don't know what, know what it is because I think Tarasenko still has a lot of game left and he needs to be healthy and in shape. And that's just going to be the way it is moving forward for him. If he's not going to be healthy or in shape, nobody's going to want him, but nobody mm -hmm. wants those players anyways. So I think Tarasenko wants to go out there, prove a point that he's still got it and he's motivated. This is the type of shit when you get traded from a team because you feel like you've been mistreated. You love to shove it up their ass. And I think that's the mindset that he's going to have. Yeah. Do point. the Islanders have any Russians on their team? They got him. Komarov. He's uh, not Russian. Komarov, he's Finnish. Is, is he he's Finnish? Finnish, right? My point is, I think these they Russians, I think these Russians need to be together. You look at Tampa, right? You got Vasilevsky, Kucherov, Shergachev. They got the goalie. I, I think if like, yeah, they got the goalie. I just think these Russian yeah. guys play better together when you put two or three of them on the same team. And for me, a yeah. team that jumps out to me is the Florida Panthers and Belzito. They got Bobrovsky in between the pipes for fucking way too much cash. Maybe you bring Tarasenko in there. Maybe it gets Bobrovsky going. I don't know. I just think these Russian guys, man, like if you put them together, it makes them it makes them happier up in Broadway yeah. and it just makes them motivated. So maybe that's, that's a spot a great that point. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see what happens. But another guy, another veteran guy, boys, that has that asked for a trade. You gotta love these veteran guys asking for trades, eh? Fuck it, right? <laughs> Jacob Voracek. Broadway, let's start with you. You're an East Coast guy. He wants out. Um is there a spot for this guy around the league or what? Maybe if, if he's motivated too, he's a great player, Broadway. Yeah, it's it's the same. I just I just feel like it's the same thing here. It, 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 it's he he's kind of done his time in Philly. He's been there for what, ten years, eleven years, and it just it hasn't seemed to. They haven't really they haven't won a championship with them. They they had that one big playoff run. I he was part of that playoff run in two thousand ten, right, Uppy, or was that eleven? So I think in he was Philly? A, yeah, yeah, in Philly. I think he was a part of that team. 
but yeah, I, I just feel like he's kind of he's kind of checked out there. I mean, I, I don't have the answers to it, but I just ten feel years like, in Philly, I'd be checked out too. I'd be checked out too. Yeah. <laughs> but I, mean, I, I just think like the management wise, he's 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 had enough of the bullshit. And then I do think that he's young enough because he's only 30, 31 years old, and a change of scenery, you know, that's it's the same attitude. You know, you kind of want to move on and prove to people you can still play. Where does he end up? Is a great question. There was huge rumors that I started last year that he was going to <laughs> Calgary, Calgary for Johnny Hockey. Maybe they'll start swirling again because there's rumors of Johnny Hockey coming back to Philadelphia starting again. But I, I don't know what type of package the Flyers gonna have to offer to get Johnny Hockey. But that's the, I think that's where Voracek could go. I think he's gonna it's gonna if when Voracek does get moved, I think it's gonna be a lot of pieces. I heard a little rumor that Johnny Hockey they may do a sign and trade Broadway. Ooh. Calgary may sign him and then trade him. So I don't know. That's just something I heard. I uh, but I think his days are his days are numbered in Calgary. But Updog, you play with Voracek. What do you think on this one, fella? I think this guy's been through a lot of change in Philly, coaches, ownership, um, management. And then you throw COVID in the mix. You can't even go get your favorite pasta dish at the restaurants and you're you're, you know, you can't see family. And I, I know how important it is for a guy like, you know, Jake. He's got He's got some kids. He, it's it's just been tough. It's hard to evaluate yeah. when a guy after this season wants to trade. Like I, and you're making all that money on a team, and all of a sudden your team stinks in the last like you know quarter of the season, and you blow it, and you don't make the playoffs, and you're supposed to be a contender, and all of a sudden all the blame goes on you. And I played in Philly. There's a ton of people pointing fingers and throwing beer bottles at everyone just <laughs> when things don't go their way. So, so for me, it's it's hard for me to not you know, favor a guy like Jake and be like, yeah, get me the fuck out of here right now. Like this, I, I only have a certain amount of time left, you know, move me, man, move yeah. me. You guys, you guys are, you're all over me. I obviously, I'm not doing the right things. You know, let's just part ways. And to me, you know, I, I would have trouble. I love Philadelphia. I love playing on that team. I, the way the ownership was back in the day, there was, it was second to none, how they treated players, how they treated staff personnel um so I, I would have a tough time realizing any guy would want to trade away from philadelphia but you know this is the times we're in things have changed and for jake i mean jake get the hell out of there go play yeah. somewhere else you're you're a hell of a hockey player you, when, when you're playing your game you control the play you're a power play guy the puck's on your stick um you you're a guy that is like you're you're a, you're a beast you're a viking look at your fucking beard you're you're, you're a freak so you know, get back to that way. Maybe it's a new locker room. Maybe it's a new, you know, shave or I don't know, stick. I don't know. But to me, he's got lots of hockey left, but it needs to be in a different position, a, a different place. And and we'll, you know, we'll see where that is. Yeah, I, I got a little landing spot for him here, boys, because he has been in Philly for 10 years. Now, this team, they have yet to re-sign Ryan Getzlaff, but I'm assuming they re-sign Ryan Getzlaff. Ooh. Bring him to fucking Anaheim. Put him on the line with Getzlaff. They're bring both, him in. They're both not speedsters. Let's up. Getsy needs a veteran guy to play with. Hey, Bob Murray, yeah. if you're listening, might be a good fit. You never know. Getsy needs a veteran guy to play with, but they still haven't even signed, re-signed Getsy yet, so we'll see what happens. And then the last thing with the Rumor Mill Broadway, it, it looks like the stars are aligning, my man, for Seth Jones in Chicago, right? Yeah. You bring his brother in. Um, I hope it happens, buddy, because you said it first. Yes, and I did. And it, I, I, I can't give away my source, but my source said – the, the Chicago Blackhawks are very high on his list. He's always wanted to be a Blackhawk. Now his brother's there. This could just be another Hayes Hayes reunion. You know, Kevin Hayes gets drafted in the first round. Next morning, older brother Jimmy sent right to Chicago. Never got to play with each other. But that's how the Blackhawks think, and that's what they're doing. Seth Jones will be a Blackhawk within the next two weeks. You heard it here first. I love on the, it. On I the, love it. On the good life rumor mill, baby. Um. Oh, I hope that happens, Broadway. Boys, this is our last uh, This sponsor. This segment is brought to you by our good friends at DraftKings. They're everywhere. They're at the home run derby last night. The guy from Oakland hit the fucking sign, the DraftKings yep. sign, and now two people are going to the World Series. You got to love these guys at DraftKings. Everywhere I look, DraftKings, epic. DraftKings. It's epic. So, awesome. How about that UFC ring, Obi? Right yeah, there, DraftKings, yeah. I was too busy. Uh, anyways, um, DraftKings <laughs> Tea Times, boys. Uh, the Montreal Canadiens. It's our last segment of Tea Times. Um, your thoughts on the Montreal Canadiens? I'll go first. Listen, I, I text Shea Weber a couple of days after, and I just said, hey, Webbs, you know, great run. Keep your head up. You'll have another crack at it. He just said, thanks, Olbs. 
Um, you got to feel for Webb's Uppy, like to go that far and to lose in the Stanley Cup Finals. And actually, our guest Ryan Malone, he's coming on. He lost in the finals. I want to ask him how long it takes you to get over it if you ever get over it. What are your thoughts on guys like Webb's and the run they had in Montreal, up dog? Uh, it was incredible, and it was incredible for for Canadian hockey fans, not just you know a Hab fan. It was great to see you know a, a Canadian team get through a get through like a beast of a team with Vegas and then, and march on to, you know, to a Stanley cup final for the first time in, in forever. I mean, since I can remember, I've never seen a Canadian team in the Stanley cup final, the Edmonton Oilers. It's like, you know, it's, it's too long. Canada needs winners. Was Vancouver, and, and with Vancouver, 2011. That Vancouver, was yeah. yeah, lost yeah. So Vancouver and Edmonton in the last 20 years. It's crazy, yeah. but, it's nuts. um, I, you know, I, I look back and I think on, on Brendan Gallagher's interview, we got emotional and Brendan Gallagher to me played his, his absolute balls off in the playoffs. And, and he led that team physically, emotionally. Um, you know, when he said there's guys in the locker room that, you know, that we, we don't know if they'll get another chance to do this. You know, it's like they, they had a chance and we had a chance to do something remarkable and magical and, and you play them for our, our, our city and our country and, and now it's over. And to me, that was to the guys like Webbs and Eric Stahl and Corey Perry, you know, those Eric Stahl and Perry have won, but Webbs hasn't. And it's tough, man. It's tough to get to the Stanley cup finals. It's tough to get to the Stanley cup playoffs, let alone the finals. And, and, you know, I, I just look at the run and I look at guys like Edmondson and this, you know, young kid like Suzuki playing out of his mind and Cole Caulfield. There's there's so many remarkable stories in and around the, the Montreal Canadiens in the last couple months that, you know, I hope that team gets remembered for what they did. They, they battle diversity. They um, they lose their coach for like almost a full fucking <laughs> round, you know, and then they got Sean Burke, a guy that was. You know, he was, he was my GM at the Spangy boys. And now he's, <laughs> now he's running the defense for, for the Montreal Canadians midway through the season. Oh, you play with Alex Burroughs. These guys, it's kind of like this story of like, wow, they just put this team together and all of a sudden they're in the finals. It's crazy. So they should be proud. It's it's, they should have a good summer and, and, you know, things are going to turn around pretty quick, but they should have a summer of like, we just played in the Stanley Cup Finals. We just put the Bell Center back on the map with with adding some fans. Um, you know, we did it for Canada. We did it for Montreal. We did it for each other. And to me, I wouldn't consider the Kucherov quote where, like, how about the Montreal <laughs> Canadiens? They think they won the fucking cup with game fucking four. I wouldn't take that into, into context. I would take the fact that they got to the Stanley Cup Finals, be very proud of it, own it, and, you know... It was a great run. That's all I want to say. It was a great run. I think run. the Montreal Canadiens, they, they got to be proud. They, they got to be really proud. They're a team that basically snuck into the playoffs. And then, you know, you ride your hut goaltender all the way to the finals. And I just find it – I saw something on Instagram or Twitter, and it was just crazy. It says, like, Cole Caulfield, like, 12 games played, one Stanley Cup finals. And then it had Shea Weber, whatever amount of years and games he's played, one Stanley Cup finals. So that just goes to show you how hard – it is to get one, get to the Stanley Cup and then win it. And for somebody like Shea Weber to finally get there and somebody carry price, I bet Carey Price is kind of kicking himself in the ass a little bit. I I don't I think Tampa's offense was too much, but there was probably a couple games and a couple goals that he wants back. And that's why after that game four, when he had that game, I was like, fuck, if he can play like this, they might be able to steal another one. But you know, they end up losing one nothing. But you know, I I I think this Montreal Canadian team's got, it's got a bright future, and they need to find a way to make Carey Price happy. I think they did go on this big run. You know, winning cures everything in my eyes, and Carey Price needs to get a little bit more respect from those fans. And uh, I think that like with Bergeron there, he he put a hell of a team together, and I think the Montreal Canadiens are here to stay. I think they're going to be a team that's going to contend. Will they make another run to the Stanley Cup Finals? I don't think so, but I do think they will make the playoffs and be a team in that uh, Atlantic Division next year. Yeah, I, you teed me up for my next question, Broadway. I disagree with you, Broadway. I think it's July 13th right now. Uh, Webb's has got a bad wrist. Uh, the list goes on and on of guys that are banged up. I, I think it's going to be too quick of a turnaround in that Atlantic Division with good teams. I hope they prove me wrong, but I just think next year in that tough division, they're going to have a hard time making the playoffs. But it's a great run. Um, it was great for Canada. They needed it up there in a time of 
of lockdown and all that nonsense. So great run of them. Shea Weber, keep your head up. We'll try to get Webbs on, boys, but I can't imagine yeah. losing in the Stanley Cup Finals. So um, real quick, boys, I wanted to ask you guys this a couple weeks ago at the start of the Stanley Cup Finals, but I forgot. Um, you saw Montreal. They didn't touch it. And then you saw Tampa win the, the Easter Conference Trophy or whatever it was called this year, and they touched it. If you guys would have ever got that far, would have you touched it? Would you not have touched it? We got the uh, – Princey sent us the, um, the statistics of guys that have touched it and haven't touched it. <laughs> what, what were your thoughts, boys? I'll go first. For those of you who know me and see me in the nightclubs, you know that I'm a toucher. So I, on the dance floor or on the ice, boys – I am grabbing that thing. If I'm if I'm like Kalorn or Headman and I'm with Stammer and we go up to grab that trophy or we go up to look at it and we feel confident and we know that this fucking team's the best team that we've we've been on, I touch the thing. I show the boys and my fans that like, hey, this is ours and let's go get the next one. So to me, I think it's a it's an old adage, you know, don't touch the don't touch the fucking conference trophy. It's bad luck. I don't know. It's a nice looking trophy. No, and when you got that nice looking trophy at, at yep. one Oak or, or at, at the fountain blue boys touch it. I don't know. Up I'm here. not bringing that trophy out though, unless the fucking Stanley cup is next to it. Cause I'm not, yeah, you don't going. need to bring it out, but you no, touch yeah. it on the other. Oh, yeah. I know you're saying, no, but you're, up, you're I, right. I, it, if my, if my captain is going up there and he's touching it, I'm right on board. I'm touching it, but it's one of those things like you've earned it. You take your picture with it and you move on and you go after that big dog, the Stanley Cup. That's the one you want to be raising and kissing. But you know what? It doesn't, to me, I don't think touching or not touching the trophy is going to determine if you win the Stanley Cup or not. And it means look at the Montreal Canadiens. They don't touch it, they lose. Tampa Bay, you know, going back to back. They already touched it the year before. You know, they partied with it all last summer or last fall, winter, whatever you want to call it. And then you go win again. So, I don't know. I think it's up in the air. If the captain wants to do it, you've earned it. You deserve it. Touch it. Up dog. The stats I would agree with you, buddy. Since 1997, the teams that did not touch it, including the Montreal Canadiens, so the last whatever, they're 11 and 16 for the teams that did not touch the trophy. So that Ooh. goes to prove your point, buddy. If you win it, pick it up, take it out with you, have a night with it because it doesn't seem to matter. So <laughs> I would have been, I wouldn't have touched it. I don't know. I was old school. I didn't know these stats, obviously. But when I played, if we won it, I wouldn't have touched it. So, uh, boys, our final uh, segment of this little podcast here is brought to you by our good friends at Canadips. It's a segment just called the Stanley Cup Champs, baby. Um, first of all, going back to back in the COVID times, the last team to go back to back up dog was the Pittsburgh Penguins. Is this even more impressive, everything they went through, being in a bubble, COVID protocol, not being able to live their life? Like, to go back-to-back, back, I know they were $18 million over the cap, but it's it's pretty impressive, up dog. It really is, Obi. Uh, a shortened season, um, you know, limited training camp, no exhibition games, uh, you know, but having the feeling, and, and this is where I think the Tampa Bay got an advantage this year, is even throughout the thick and, you know, the the, the blood and the, you know, the, the shitty times that we all dealt with everyone, these guys had something so remarkable that they got to experience throughout COVID. They won, they were champs. They had this uplifting experience in a moment where everyone was still not seeing family and, and, you know, stuck in between countries. And, and these guys got to share a moment with each other. And a lot of them were together. There was maybe, you know, four or five guys that weren't on the team this year that were on it last year. And, and I'm actually, I'm in the office of one right here, Kevin Shattenkirk. He's got his Stanley, little mini Stanley Cup downstairs. He's got his cup coming this week. Up here. Yeah, so, so, so we'll, and we'll talk about that. But to me, that was an advantage. Um, they have, yeah, we have short memories, boys. We get hit in the head a lot. They won 10 months ago in, in Edmonton in a fashion of, of a weird, unique bubble. And then they go back to the Stanley Cup finals this year. And I remember Lupul saying like, are these guys really plus 800 to win the Stanley Cup at the start of the playoffs? How do you not take that? These guys just won. They're healthy. They're getting Kucherov back, who's their best player. Hedman is the, another Norris Trophy candidate, and they have Vasilevsky. How do they not take this thing down, you know, down the rabbit hole again and win? And you look back at it now, and you're like, great point. It's like it was so fresh in their mind, and – they were playing unbelievable hockey. John Cooper is one of the best coaches, I think, of our modern era. He's He speaks so well. 
I watched game four, uh, yeah, a chance for them to sweep. I watched game four with Braden Shen and what he said about Luke and the way that this John Cooper talks to his team. Every word the guy says is meaningful. Everything yeah. he says before a game proves, you know, proves a point, sends a message, whether it's good or bad. Um, and to me, like, so, so I was sitting there with, with Shenner too. And, and he got a text cause I told his brother, and I said this last week, but I told his brother, Hey, get your gear ready. Right. Fucking put your gear on. Well, after, after the game, he sent a message to Shenner and it said like, how often are you going to sweep the Stanley cup finals? And I guarantee that word came from John Cooper's mouth. I don't know if it did or not, but like that message is like, guys, we're going to do this. Trust it. You guys are the best, you're the best team in the world right now. And just trust it. And that, that you saw happen when Kucherov got on camera after when Vasilevsky stood on the bench with his elbow and accepted the con Smythe, knowing that he was the MVP of the playoffs, what he did. They're just a, they're a team that, you know, the Pittsburgh Penguins boys beat out uh, San Jose, their first cup uh, who in San Jose had beat us out in St. Louis that year. They were a team that was on a mission. Uh, and then they win again. And then that, that what's Tampa Bay is that team right now. And we're watching a team that might win three that, you know, they're going to lose players, but they have a chance to win three. When you have Vasilevsky and Hedman and Kucherov and point, you have those four guys. There's no stopping you. You can be the best team every night. So you can beat and be the best team every night. Um, so I don't know. It was, it was awesome to watch a great finals, a great playoffs, great job NHL. Um, but that's yeah. Tampa Bay. They fuck. Yeah. Yeah, I, I I think it's one of the most impressive cups to win because, like you said, they go and win the cup last year in the bubble. Then they come home and they got a short no, – no preseason, no exhibition games. And then you got to deal with from September to, uh, let's say, uh, December, are we going to play? They, they had no idea is this season going to start. No, they didn't – like sitting there watching my brother, when do I start preparing for the season – Granted, he's one of those guys, along with the guys that he works out with, that they were kind of working out for a while. But it's just one of those things that there's so many question marks up in the air. How is this season going to go? Then they got to grind through all this COVID bullshit the whole season. And then I think the best thing that happened for them was to be able to get some fans back in the building for the playoffs. So to to me, the Tampa Bay Lightning, what you guys just did, some people might try to say that the shortened season helped them or whatever, but... I, I can't believe it. I think it's unbelievable to be able to go back to back cups during these crazy times. They're going to go down as probably one of the best teams in history. And I think they're going to continue to keep winning because that roster is just loaded. Yeah. They're going to lose some pieces, which we're going to get to here in a little bit, but I'm going to give some love to their fucking third line. I mean, Barkley Goudreau, man, that fucking shot he blocked to Shea Weber's. Are you kidding me, man? Webbs came in like it was the slap shot contest of the all-star game and laid into it. And Goodrow just right in the lane, didn't miss a shift. Yanni Gord fucks. Coleman, he's going to get paid too. That third line was unbelievable, going back to back. Um, without them, I don't think they do it. Uh, boys, Updog, you want to talk about Kucherov's press conference? Um, fucking guy signs a deal with Bud Light. I mean, that's a that's an endorsement I could have got throughout my career maybe was the old Bud Light deal, but um, oh. Kucherov's doing some fucking Updog. Boys, he, he put himself... In, in 1A, in, in Tier 1A to me, um, there are certain players in the world that that can change the game with, with the quickest one touch or vision, um, never makes a bad play, you know, isn't overly, like, the fastest guy on the ice, like, you know, Connor McDavid. But, man, every time this guy touches the puck or every time he's on the ice, you were just expecting, like, the best hockey play or the coolest goal or just like this unbelievable play. So, so as far as his performance on the ice is he's world-class and he's only, he's still young. He's getting better. What he's doing off the ice is fucking legendary. <laughs> what he's doing when he wins, what he's doing when he wins these cups boys is separating himself from the new era NHLer to the fucking guy in 1985 who was carrying that trophy around fucking Long Island or something when they used to win fucking four or five <laughs> cups in a row and probably just mangling, like just getting mangled, going missing for days and days and days and, and truly making hockey the coolest sport to win the championship in because Halsey, or Hazy, you know this, getting a free pass is one thing for a weekend with your buddies. <laughs> but when you win the fucking Stanley Cup, you can go do whatever 
whatever you want. And it is like what you're supposed to do. It's like what you're supposed to do. Look at how mangled this guy's getting right now. It's so awesome. Like, yeah, that's what, but because you won this cop and, and he's doing that. And it's epic. Oh, my God, my God, my God. It's it's beautiful. Um, so I, I and then go on. I, I want you guys to touch on Cooch because what he's doing yeah. is spectacular. And then I want to talk about something else. After. No, but I just I just love seeing the interviews. Like I, I wake up each morning and I just go right to the, all the NHL things I follow on Instagram and Twitter. I'm like, where's Kucherov? What did he do last night? School with his name. And he he's been legendary right now. It's been it's been fun to watch him. And it's just great to see, you know, He's enjoying himself. You know, you won the Stanley Cup. You got to go have some fucking fun. And he's proved it. Like, he missed the whole season. He comes out, and he's the best player in the world during the Stanley Cup playoffs. And he's, you know, he's living up to that Russian uh, stereotype of just getting after it when they win. So hats off to him. And, and I know I hope he has a couple more fun weeks. Fuck, is he having a time? He is having a time. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, if you if you lead the league in playoff scoring, you could do what you want. So, Cooch, keep it going. Um, shout out to the big rig three in a row, man. Um, yeah, shout oh, yeah. out. That's what I want. Big rig, man. Three, three in a row. row. Guy's a beauty. Name. People said he was too slow. Look at him now. He's got three fucking bugs. So, uh, did you want to touch on the big rig <laughs> up dog? I did. Yeah, I was there. I mean, I was in St. Louis for their cup run. I watched him play in the playoffs there, boys. Um, to me that touched home. Uh, I met the guys in Vegas after didn't touch the cup. Cause one day who knows, never know if you get a chance to win it, whether you're in the fucking trainer's room or you're massaging guys or you're fucking, you're shooting one timers in from Kucherov, who the fuck knows, but I haven't won yet. So I didn't touch it, but the big rig, I watched him win his first and I felt like it was awesome. And now watching him win his third, it's just something that's, uh, it just doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. A guy winning three in a row and doing it in that fashion and, you know, having that look and uh, crushing those beers. And uh, so happy for him. And uh, let's get him on the pod for a fucking shout out. And I love that the big Greg is still winning these cups because he's keeping the big man alive in the NHL. And I know every big man who's got some nice soft mitts, who doesn't skate that well, is the fucking staring at the big rig and being like, you are keeping my dream alive. So the big, <laughs> the big rig is keeping guys' careers going. And I, I hope, you know what, he's got to continue to play because he is effective. Yeah, I mean, he's not the fastest guy, but when he gets that puck down low, good luck. Try to get it back from him. He fucking protects the puck with the best of them. And he's got the sick mitts around the net to, to finish out the plays. And I love seeing that he wins. You know, teams are going to keep signing him because, fuck, you sign him, you win. It's a no-brainer. Yeah. Yeah, he's got one more year in Tampa, but absolutely Broadway. He's big, he's strong, he protects pucks, he makes plays on the wall. The big rig fuck. So congratulations, three in a row. That's insane to me. Uh, boys, Vasilevsky. I believe last week we all voted. I think we all said Kucherov for MVP. Con yes. Smythe. We were wrong, and I have no problem with Vasilevsky. Since he's the only goalie since Ken Dryden to play in every single game in back-to-back -back Stanley Cup Finals appearances. So, um, boys, he played unbelievable again in Game 5. I think it's safe to say this guy's the best goalie in the world, eh, Broadway? Yeah, it's I, I like th those stats after a loss. That just speaks for itself. He he played at a, another level, and he has played another level for two years now. And to be able to depend on your goalie, and you know that he's going to play every single night for you, that that's such a an asset to have in your lineup. And I, he, he's proven himself. He is by far the best goalie in the world. Yeah, Hazy, the way that Cooch talked about him after, um, yeah. it, it proves that you have your team's trust and that no matter what happens in one game, they know their next game is a new 60 minutes and we have Vasilevsky in that and that he's going to make a save whether we come out flat and that we get peppered, you know, which didn't really happen much in this playoffs. I think they had incredible starts, but you know, no matter what happens, he's going to make timely saves the guy's a absolute freak when he's when he's standing between the pipes and um, you know any goalie out there looks at that guy and, and we've had Shaddy Obi you and I sat around with Shaddy the one day and talked to him about about Vasilevsky like the guy is is as good in practice as he is in in the Stanley Cup Finals so a guy that practices just as well as he plays is is a champion and a, and a well deserved consummate trophy winner. Um, so he deserves on that trophy, even when it's sitting on top of his shoulders. Like he I, was, I was just going to say, there. he seems like a beauty too. He was wearing it as a fucking hat on the boat. I was like, Hey, you win the con Smythe, you can wear it as a fucking hat. <laughs> um, boys, they, they've been doing it right. Stammer pulls an all nighter. The first night with the cup takes a picture 
at a sick house in Davis Island with the cup with the sun coming up. Vaskalevsky, Kucherov, the big rig, and they've done a number on the Stanley Cup. Do you see the picture yesterday? The big rig? They <laughs> oh, dented. Oh, man. They fucking dented the side of it. That's okay, right? You win it, you can fuck it up. They'll fix it, right? Right, Broadway? Do they take uh, that? Do they, they take that right back to Toronto to fix it? Or is like the cup gone for a couple days? Or I think like, she's off. Be a sh- uh, yeah, I think they're off to actually Montreal, I, I think I read. So somewhere, they're just going to take mini cups from last year out? <laughs> no, well, they got their two, they got their three, four days with it, which I think is like standard. And then obviously it goes, you know, it goes somewhere for a few days, whether yeah. it's like, like sponsors or whatever the hell. The thing's the most popular person in hockey, the Stanley Cup, by the way. Yeah. It travels to more cities per, you know, per day than any team, any player. Um, but that thing, it's taken a beating over the years. So I'm sure maybe one little nick on it. Or making it turn like into a cone head is <laughs> is just what you got to do just to prove that you're you're absolutely going as hard as you can with that. Thing. Yeah, yeah it, it'll bounce back. It'll straighten it out. That cup's seen a lot of worse things than that. But uh, the last thing, boys, to put put a little wrap up on the Tampa Bay Lightning. Listen, we know it's a business. We all went through it. Um, they're over the cap, boys. Uh, Julian Breezebois, he has his fucking hands full. Uh, they're 85 million right now, or something like that. Maybe even more. What do you think they're going to do? Is it, What guy would you leave unprotected? I mean, there's going to be some tough decisions. Um, you know, I'll go first. For me, Yanni Gord and Anthony Sorelli, I'm protecting both those guys. I'm not letting either one of those yeah. guys go. Palat is a guy I absolutely love, but unfortunately, they're in a tough spot. I think they have to leave him unprotected. Goudreau, they're going to probably lose the free agency. Blake Coleman, they're going to probably lose the free agency. I mean, Broadway, Updog, this team, they're going to lose some key, key pieces. Uh, but hey, they got two Stanley Cup rings, right, boys? Yeah, and that's what, that's what you know. As a GM, as an owner, as a player, that's exactly what you want, and that's what happens when you win. Everybody wins. Everybody gets paid, and now you got guys that are going on back to back Stanley Cups, so they might make more money than they probably should. And I, there's lots of rumors in Boston that they're going to go full court press on this Goudreau kid, and you know that adds depth to their bottom six, and it makes complete sense. But, I mean, I, it sounds like they're going to try to buy out Tyler Johnson. So I don't know who they're going to protect. Like, but, like, I think Andre Pilat and somebody like Alex Kalorn, those could be two names that are left unprotected. And you have to assume Seattle's taking one of those guys because I don't think there's any guys in the back end they're going to take. So I, that's what happens, though. When you win, you win, you, you got to pay the price. But you got two Stanley Cups for it. I mean, if you have if a you chance. Get- Sorry, Obi. Go ahead. You, I was go just going to say, if you get a chance to get Alex Kalorn, I mean, are you kidding me? I would do everything I could to be like that to. guy. But I mean, it's the it's the position they're in, Obi. They're they're up against it. If you get Andre Palat too, you take him. To me, last year in the finals, in that COVID bubble, boys, that guy was was a wrecking ball. And yeah. to, whether we don't know, was he was was he hurt this year? He, yeah, he plays a point in Kucherov, so he's on a great line. But he has been, to me, playing against that guy too. He has balls, and he plays hard, and he plays, you know, he plays a big game. So it, a guy like Kalorn or him, I mean, it sucks. But yeah, if you if, you, if you're gonna have to lose a guy, you know, your change your team's gonna change. Um, yeah. And then Goudreau. Is is going somewhere? I read Boston too, Hazy, because he plays a Boston Bruins style of game. Blake yeah. Coleman, man, the goals he scored and just the minutes he played, and he plays that like under your, you know, he pissed off everyone on that Montreal lineup. And I think they knew if if they focused on him, they could maybe get him to take some bad penalties. But the guy just won two Stanley Cups in a row, man, and he was a big part of of you know turning that team into a really good team into a championship team. Yeah. Yeah, it's it, it's a hell of a run. I mean, anytime you can win two Stanley Cups like that. Um, so congratulations to Tampa Bay Lightning. Boys, that wraps up the fucking NHL season for us. I want to say thank you for both you beauties, all your hard work. Um, and to Gary Bettman, listen, I chirp Bettman all the time. I still think he's a bit of a clown sometimes, but he handed out two Stanley Cups during COVID period. So you got to tip your hat to Gary. Um, we're into the off season now, boys, but it was an absolute pleasure breaking down the entire NHL season with both you beauties. I'm going to chug this beer just for that right here. All right. We got our, we got our guest coming up. Speaking of absolute beauty, who doesn't mind chugging a beer, Ryan Malone, AKA Bugsy Malone coming at you. Up dog Scoopsy. 
Aura rings, baby. Broadway's been sleeping like a baby ever since he got it up, dog. Hey, Z, I got to be honest. I've put in a solid, solid week and a half of some Ooh. quality sleeps. And I got to be honest. I have my babysitter, Lily, here. She is a she's a godsend one vacation when you got little Izzy who's waking up. You know, she might get up early one day where big up dog wants to maybe sleep in a little bit, you know, and uh, and the mama's mama bears just, you know, she's in bed snuggled up. It's important to sleep or a ring. Jimmy Scoops provides us a very intelligent statistic based uh, view on how we're sleeping, how our energy's feeling. How our workouts are going. And to me, it's the most innovative sleep monitoring system, fitness system uh, to wear. And it looks damn good, too. You sure wear it on does. either that pinky finger like the big obes because he can't <laughs> fit her on his other fingers. Or like you, you put, you put on the winning finger. You let the people know that you got that nice lady beside you and you're sleeping well. But Aura Ring is, to me, the best wearable technology it known sure to It sure is, up, dog. And like I said last week. I had a I had a rough weekend, and the aura ring it was reminding me daily. I love when it's like I had uh, I think I had a couple late nights last weekend, and then leading up all week eight fifteen nine o'clock I'm getting that little message on my phone. It's time to wind down. I don't like to see that message that often on a Friday, <laughs> but I'll let the aura ring do its run its course. And the one thing I love about it is I wear it during golf. And it tracks all your activity. So I know how many calories I'm burning, how many steps I'm taking. Not That's just on top of the sleep. So the Aura Ring does it all. I think it's actually better than the Apple Watch. The or- If it could only cut down a few strokes and fix your short game. Oh, this thing would be money. You I'd have really a one on your it. finger. <laughs> Aura Ring packs advanced heart rate, Jimmy Scoops, heart rate variability, temperature, activity, and sleep monitoring sensors into a convenient, non-evasive ring. Advanced body temperature sensors allow to detect changes happening inside your body, sometimes even before it knows yourself. Aura Ring comes in two styles and four colors, boys. Silver, black, stealth, matte black, and the new limited edition Heritage Gold Aura Ring. For only $299 to $399, bucks, boys, you can give or get the gift of health by visiting... AuraRing.com. <laughs> Welcome back to Missing Curfew. Up Dog Broadway. We have talked about this beauty a few times in our uh, our short stint here at Missing Curfew. A guy that I played with for a short time, but was one of my favorites, and we definitely missed a couple curfews together. Ryan Malone, aka Bugsy Malone, Bugsy. Sick Eddie Vedder painting behind you, buddy. Thanks. Where's the intro music? I said I need that Metallica and her Sandman on ACDC. Hell's I bells. Just get the, get the hair to stand up on the arms again. Bugsy oh, texts me. Bugsy yeah, thanks text for having me, me, guys. He texts me last night, boys. He's like, oh, just give me a little fucking thunderstruck or something. What, what am I coming into? So we'll, we'll tee that up for you after, Bugsy. Okay. Thanks, buddy. Hey, uh, how's everything with you, buddy? I saw actually something on your social media. You were living the good life in the hot tub with the feet up on the lake. Well deserved, buddy. Life's good. Yeah, life uh, life has been good. Uh, there's always a new opportunity and I guess job now. But before that, uh, just being here in Minnesota um, with my new family, I had twins uh, almost two years ago now, so just uh, enjoying them and my two boys. So doing the family job and then. Um, Actually, it was, you know, I think all of us, when we, we leave the game, we're looking for that team element uh, to be heckled and uh, have a few beers with the guys and end up uh, <laughs> volunteering at the fire department. Oh, uh, nice. So, yeah, that's why I'm looking a little leaner, Hazy. Uh, you know, he's got <laughs> Look at uh, Jack, the man. gear on. It's like just a sweet song. I mean, you're just sweating it all out in there. You so see it right in your it, face. Uh, like, look, my face looks like I fucking got stung by a couple bees. You're looking fucking good. Nice thin neck. Fuck, bud. <laughs> A little, a little leaner, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I think we're all looking to the, be part of that team and, you know, for a goal that's uh, greater uh, than yourself. So it was uh, very lucky to be able to be a part of that. But now I think might be leading out of that role into this uh, new job. 
Well, is, is there any firefighters that just have like these epic that like, you know, you, you relied on some of the young pups to come in and tell stories about chasing chicks. Like, is there any young firefighters that just come in and you're like, Oh, what did you do last night, kid? Like, hey, did you, were yeah, you blowing out any fires pretty- or, or were you using your hose in another uh, fashion? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, it's, it's actually truly amazing when you kind of really see and put the boots on what all the, the people are about. I mean, the whole, uh, why is that a fire department? all volunteer, um, you know, and there's actually 70, like I, I put a tweet out today, there's 70% of all firemen are all volunteers. So, I mean, they have other jobs they're doing. Um, so there's a, there's a few guys on our squad that are a little younger, but they're going out for the air force or other, um, you know, careers and the training they do and the commitment they have uh, for themselves and to others is just uh, really amazing. So I've really been touched uh, in that way. And even, I always joke around. I had that little power duster going for a little bit because uh, you have to shave the face. So the mask stays on tight, you know, so you can't get any smoke in there. So I don't think I ever used a razor only my whole life really until I got the job. So uh, yeah, this is uh, a new look, but uh, like I said, it was just a great giving back and uh, you know, you feel good and can sleep at night knowing uh, you're trying to help people. Hey, who's got bigger hoses, hockey guys or firefighters? <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that, that's the scary part the guys don't really shower after you just kind of go and you're, you're on a leave so like even putting the stuff on i'm like don't we get down our underwear before we <laughs> put the pants on because some people throw the jeans on and then they're shit and i mean like yeah. sweating oh, there. So the first time i'm just down to my gitch and they're like looking at me sideways i'm like you're like i'm a hockey guy go. i think oh. Yeah, <laughs> I used to go no undergear at all just to make sure I could feel that cold breeze on my ball. Wake me up. Hey, Bugsy, I yeah. see that Steve Miocic. She does that fire, uh, volunteer firefighting stuff too. And like, he was the heavyweight champ of the UFC, and these guys were like treating him like a rookie. Did you have to go through that at the firefighting station too? Did you have to pay your dues as a rook? Uh, uh, they definitely heckled me as Grant Hink way back in my rookie year. I did like, uh, you know, silly, like picture worth my tattoos. Um, and, you know, next thing I know with, in my locker, there's the picture, you know, they put in my locker. Um, it, it was, it was just great to be heckled. And then usually after like drill night, you just go have a few beers at the local pub. Um, but you know, they're, they're hockey fans and just good people. And they just amazing that they have other careers and they just do this on the side really. Uh, when the pager goes off, they drop what they're doing and try to, to help people. So it's uh, it was just a great experience. Just a lot of uh, just like the hockey guys, you know, it's all you're all just doing it for each other and one one goal. So it's good to feel a part of that. No, that's a great point by you, Bugsy, because when you do retire, there's lots of stuff you miss, but the camaraderie of the boys, and we get that here at Missing Curfew, and Uppy and myself belong to a pretty good golf club where you're in there having drinks with the boys before the round and after the round, and it's probably one of the things, and, and you were one of the best teammates to ever do it, like the, the fun stuff of hockey, and, and it's just cool to have that after your career too, right? Yeah, I mean, same thing with you guys. I had a great uh, golf course up the road, uh, the Winsong Farm. I'll have to have you guys up here in Minnesota. Um, just good people. It's just the golf club. There's no pool, you know, there's none of that other fancy stuff as a golf club. And then even uh, a few winters ago, they started a little uh, pond hockey tournament. So they're hockey guys. And um, we even have my cousin's uh, bachelor party up there. They got a little house you can stay at. So, I mean, we had, I think they let us golf in and ate some as long as we weren't like slow and play or anything, but we had wigs on, um, for his wife's side. And then we had different phrases of Brad Malone, my cousin, he's in Baco right now. Um, so, and they just let us, you know, as long as we're being respectful and, you know, moving around and not uh, bothering anybody, um, you know, they enjoy that and they understand that it's just guys having a good time. No one's uh, getting hurt as long as they're, you know, respecting other people and in, in, in everyone's time. So you got no pool, but do you got a hot tub? Because Obes and I get to go have a soak after the match. Hey, eh? we get to we get the TV in there. We get to bring the cold beers in there, throw them up. Hey, eh? be like Obes, oh. man. Remember the soaks after the match? Hey, eh? all the boys just in here. Just that setup's unbelievable. <laughs> yeah. Oh, there's nothing yeah, like that, a good soak uh, after a tough match. <laughs> yeah, that sounds uh, nice. We're working on a few of those finer <laughs> details for the fellas. Um, obviously, in Minnesota, it'd be nice to have a place to go hang out in the winter too a few simulators so they got a great owner um he used to be like a gold glove boxer back in the day so i mean he's he's an athlete so he, he gets it and he's all about the, the boys so it's uh, just a special place and there's a lot of great people there 
Bugsy, uh, I want to first of all thank you for coming on, buddy. You're an absolute beauty and a legend around the league, especially from our days of playing. And, and we got lots of stuff we want to cover, mainly fun stuff. But we, we just focused on, you know, the wrap-up of the Stanley Cup Finals. And, and before I met you, bro, you know, you just lost in the Stanley Cup Finals with the Pittsburgh Penguins. Yeah, you got a nice seven-year ticket when you came to Tampa. But we just talked about, like, how hard was it that, Bugsy, getting over losing in the Finals, being that close? Like, do you still think about it? Or, or did it take you a couple years? Because personally, my man, I can't even imagine going that far and, and not being able to get it done. Yeah, I think about, I mean, you get the goosebumps every time, I think. I mean, you lay it all on the line. Uh, to lift that one trophy, right? I mean, that's why I think it's the hardest trophy to win in sports. I mean, there's one. It's not uh, you're going to make a new one next year for the next team. There's one of them. Um, and to have, you know, that that bond with the team, you, you know, the teams that buy in. You, know, you look at the Islanders, everyone's like, you know, complaining about Montreal, whatever, Connor McDavid, this and that. But it's, it's, you can have the best player in the world. You got you have the best team, right? That's what hockey is yeah. so special. You need everyone. <laughs> And someone might get hurt, and the next guy up is the is the mentality uh, of is, is is for the boys, and especially come playoff time, you don't care who's scoring the goal as long as you know you get the last one at the end of the game. Um, and, it, and the further you go, it comes down to those details of you know taking short shifts or you know just making a smart line change or a face off play because it's so competitive and it's just almost like a chess match when two teams are really playing to their top levels, um, and it's exciting. But I mean. To, to have that as your childhood dream and, you know, come so close. Yeah, it definitely hurt uh, to lose, especially, you know, being from Pittsburgh and watching Mario lift the cups there in 91, 92, um, and kind of being behind the scenes with that. My dad was, was uh, well, played there and also was a head scout. So he drafted Yager all the way up to Crosby, Flurry, and Biz, and Witt, and all those <laughs> but, wow! Uh, what a, that's so cool. It seems like there's one. There seems like there's, you know, like there's the one the name side. that's wrong there. There's one name that doesn't fit in there. There's <laughs> <laughs> a late round pick. So let me just do a guard at the board and play it on. I think uh, you know, just being in like the, the Steve Latin was there is the same uh, guy that I was taking Mark Recky sticks and using when I was a kid. And I made the team and got to play with Rex and uh, I got to play with Mario. Uh, you know, learn how to play cards the right way through Mario. <laughs> um, it was just, uh, it was a special time in the playoff hockey is uh, we really think, uh, you know, puts hockey on the map um, and people get to see the sacrifice the players go through uh, to lift that trophy. And it's, it's truly a special uh, thing. And, you know, hockey communities of brotherhood and it's, uh, it's great. It's great to be part of. Yeah, Bugsy, you got to play with, Kind of, I have two here, but probably three of the biggest names in hockey with that are Crosby, Stamkos, and Hedman's all as rookies. I know their stats and career speak for themselves, but as a teammate, did you like see these two as special talents right from the start? Like, were you just kind of wowed by these three kids, or were you just kind of like, all right, let's see what these kids can do? They're all high draft picks. Yeah, I think in Pittsburgh camp, I mean, when Sid was on the ice, he just was exploding like in a game at around like. <laughs> slow down but it was like <laughs> whoa like you know and you could just tell i remember him, we went to the buckle in pittsburgh to get him jeans and he had to get custom jeans to fit around his you know his ass because he's <laughs> like quadzilla and uh it was just amazing to see him you know come in as a young kid but so determined obviously and uh i guess polished if you want to call him because he was used to the pressure and all the press in his face every day um and then see stammer and Hetty come out. I just remember poor Hetty. I think he got like a Reebok deal those first year with the, the holes in the stick, you know, <laughs> that was Reebok synergies or whatever. They oh were. yeah. And he kept his shot. His shot wasn't that good. Even like Marty and Vinny, everyone's like, but well, they're paying me. You know, like, Hey, get a new stick. They'll pay you a lot more. Don't worry. And uh, he ended up obviously doing really well, but it's just a, just a great kid and human being, you know, Hetty is, and obviously a great teammate and stammer, um, he literally lived right across the street from me in Tampa. Mike Smith was literally two houses down. And we had Mark Recchi another few houses down our first year in Tampa there. And it was, uh, it was really special. And, you know, people don't understand when you, like you're 18 years old playing in a, a, a man's, a man's game. Now it's not just hockey for fun. Like you're trying to take, you know, you know, the food off my table. I have kids at home. So yeah, I'm going to, run you over if I have to, or I'm going to get in your head or whatever it is. It's not like you're playing juniors anymore. This is a, I think an eye opener becomes a job. Um, 
And I think with Barry and the ownership, their their heart and passion was in the right place. But sometimes, you know, I think Barry was, you know, not as detailed as uh, or structured as the new age was of becoming, you know. Yeah. So I think um, they kind of played with him a little bit there, but I was happy to be on his line um and just say hey man just skate i'll, I'll you know i'm gonna go to the net and give you the pot you do your thing <laughs> if anything happens to you just I'm, I'm coming to i'm coming in there so you know you can do whatever you want out here um just to kind of you know let them know he's okay but um you know i think with stammer i remember 18 like first sushi taking the sushi and red wine you know he's 18 and hasn't had any of that stuff before so i think it was just a cool experience uh to help uh, some of these, you know, guys. And I was lucky to be obviously blessed with uh, great teammates and line mates, but all those guys have one thing in common. It's the, their passion and love for the game. I think that's why all of us have reached, you know, the top level. We all just love it so much and we're willing to do whatever it takes to get there. And it's, uh, like I said, it's a, it's a, a hockey community is a, a powerful community. I'm happy to be part of it. Remember taking the old stammer to the rack, eh? Back in the day, Bugsy. Come on, stammer. We'll take you oh, to the rack. Oh, well, well good we'll sushi, sushi at the rack. Play good some sushi. fucking. So, Bugsy, hey, I gotta, I gotta ask you about. Man, we're going for sushi and a few cocktails. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta ask you about this. I, I wanted to bring up stammer. What you just said was perfect. So, but remember, we had stammer on after they won the Stanley Cup last year in the bubble, and. I brought up the time where I want to get to you about Prague, but remember before the first game against the Rangers, the boys had a closed door meeting because we had no system. We're like, fuck boys, we got no system. It was like Marty, Vinny, and fucking Rob's trying to teach the boy the left wing lock. We're like, what the fuck are you talking about here, boys? <laughs> oh, yeah, that was just a crazy thing. Obviously, just coming off as losing the Stanley Cup, we were very structured and detailed, and you had a game plan. And, and, you know, Barry was just that old school, I think, because he had, you know, Gretzky and those guys before. It's like, okay, the boys will do the boys stuff. And we're all looking around like, are we, are we going to practice any systems yet? Or we're just like, we literally, <laughs> I think, in Prague, just like played shinny hockey. And poor Mike Smith, I think, had to stop 40, 50 shots both nights. I mean, I think we might have lost both those games. But <laughs> Did we I just ever? remember we were, you know, going around, playing all these exhibition games. Uh, against whatever teams in Europe, you know, it's just kind of like, I don't even know why we're really doing that. But, and I remember, I think it was one clip where Stammer, I just look over and it looks like he got boarded. And then I end up uh, fighting, I think it was Robin Regera's brother. And I, I didn't even like, I just said, I'm coming. I just dropped my miss and just started chucking at me. You know, so we're in Europe and you just ran Stammer. But then I remember fighting Robin after in the NHL and we're, you know, we're tussling and then he gets me down or whatever. He found me like, that's for my brother. I'm like, well, I would ask him to fight if I known he was like Canadian, at least, you know, <laughs> at least. Uh, but uh, it's funny how it all came back around, but uh, yeah, it was, uh, yeah, those first uh, few weeks in Tampa were, uh, you know, interesting. They were fucking more interesting. Do you remember when we were over there and we were supposed to fly in to play Berlin and our plane <laughs> broke down in Prague, remember? And me and you were fucking hung titty, obviously, but our plane breaks down. We show up to Berlin like 15 minutes before the game, Bugsy, and we come in. Their team is like humming, remember? Before we're like, I look at you, like, I'm like, Bugsy, should you say something to the boys here? Like, and they just came out and peppered us, remember? <laughs> yeah, I think that's where I end up just fighting the guy. I think we're just like, what are we doing here? Like, we're just, it was just, uh, yeah, it was just like we were playing shinny hockey and we had so many new faces on the team and we didn't really know whose role was what, you know, and everyone's just kind of, you know, you know, playing old school hockey. So, I mean, it, uh, I mean, the owners were very passionate hockey people, you know, but a lot of fans, same thing, they don't get it until you really play and understand, you know, what the behind the scenes is and how much the equipment guys matter, right? You know, those guys are really the backbone of the whole operation. If those guys aren't on point, you know, guys aren't getting their sticks or their gear or feel comfortable, well, they're not going to play well. You know, those those guys don't get enough credit for getting guys back on the ice. Uh, and I know for a fact in Pittsburgh, uh, it's, uh, it's a great staff, but those boys in Tampa, um, you know, I, I get goosebumps talking about because I was in the, obviously the – injured quite a bit and uh, they did whatever they could to get me on the ice and uh, that a lot of people don't give those guys enough credit that's for sure hey that's it's so funny Bugsy you mentioned like fuck we show up 15 minutes before the game and you need that old school mentality to be like I can't get into this game unless I just drop my gloves and start punching someone so that's what I said yeah. <laughs> totally fucking intercept 
<laughs> yeah, all, all our listeners are just like, fuck, man, we know what that's like. When we show up to the men's league game, we're late. Like, we got to fight or our team's like, why were you late, bud? You're like, well, I'll get in the game. I'll fucking beat someone up. Watch me. You know, it's, just, yeah. it's such a good mentality to have. Oh, yeah. Get hit or even get run over or whatever it takes. Right. Just keep, wake get up in the game. Yeah. Wake up. We're, we're playing. <laughs> hey, Bugsy, when you were in Tampa, bro, you were a fan favorite and you spent some time there. Just touch on like the city man like how good of a hockey city is it's finally getting the recognition now with back-to-back championships but just living in tampa going there playing in front of the fans i was there for two and a half years it's it's a pretty special place to play yeah hands down i mean i i, I tweeted after they won i mean it li- literally is hockey paradise um it's a smaller town so it's not like there's crazy traffic or any of that other like just little nuisance things you have in other cities but I mean, ultimately, like I said, the owners came in uh, and were very passionate uh, when Oren Coolis and those uh, guys were on board. But then when uh, Mr. Vinick uh, took over, I mean, he, he's done so much for the community. Even during the lockout, he was continuing to give away money to the local heroes um, that are in the, you know, in the schools, in the community that are really helping people. And, you know, good things happen to good people. So, I mean, he surrounded himself with a great team, even Stevie Y., he kind of built those teams, obviously, but uh, yeah. he's not there to reap the rewards. But he, he obviously is a great hockey mind in person as well. But um, it starts at the top at the top and trickles all the way down, like I said, and it goes right to the equipment guys, to the training staff, to the logo on the, on the ground um, and uh, creating that culture. So I got to see, you know, both years uh, or, or both teams from Pittsburgh. We, when I first came in the league, we were, you know, dead last. And then we got to the Stanley Cup final and then similar in Tampa, how we started at the bottom there. And then we got uh, pretty close to the one year losing to Boston, which is another uh, special team, um, you know, game seven of Boston. We lost in the Eastern Conference final there. But um, yeah, I mean, it uh, is, it is a hockey paradise, man. I mean, you days off there. That's why I, coming from Pittsburgh days off guys go to the rink with their kids, you know, to skate or work out. In Tampa, days off. Guys are at the beach or on the course. <laughs> Never a bad day in Florida. Day, Never there's a stuff bad to day. do. You know, yeah, there's stuff to do. So it's kind of good you can get away from the game. But then it's uh, when you walk in with your flip flops on, when you put your skates on, you got to know hey, it's game time. I got I got to focus and not just be in La La Land all the time. I got to <laughs> uh, earn you know earn it. So. Uh, but it is it's great for you know I think for you to get away from the game to recover and then you come into the rink and feel that uh, cold air then you know it's just, it's go time. Bugs, you bring up a Bugsy, great- did you go, yeah. go ahead ups go ahead ups go ahead Obs. No, you go. I was gonna say now that we're on you know now that you talk we're talking Tampa, um, but I want to bring it back a little bit in in Pittsburgh. Your time in Pittsburgh, we're playing in the old igloo. The fucking smell in that barn was like, it was like what Nassau Coliseum had this year with beers and cigarettes and hot dogs and popper. Yeah. I I mean, getting dressed in that rink, you know, there was four little tiny dressing rooms put together and like kind of carved through like these, these, these doors for the visiting team, but you could smell and like hear it just smelt like hockey. It heard like hockey playoff time in there was incredible because we would like get stuck in that room. And then all of a sudden, like, you know, you, you come out and, and to people listening, like, in Pittsburgh, we would have to come across your red line in warmups and you would have to come across our red line in warmups. And that, that's sort of like that feeling in playoff hockey too, when everyone's like there in warmups and you're fucking looking at a guy like Bugsy's fucking skating by fuck you, Bugsy, you know, you give, give a guy a little chirp and we, so, you know, just to, to relive it, we had a tough team. We had Cote, Jason Smith, Hatcher. You guys have George LaRock yourself. Uh, did you have England back? Yeah, no, you were Gary, Gary Roberts. Roberts. It was yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, they were there were some yeah, wars, Rutu. and that was the time. Yeah. I mean, you guys, yeah, root root two, right? Eric Christensen, pussy, yeah. but he was my <laughs> line mate back in June. <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> yeah. I love Crush. Hey, Crush is a good guy. I'm just kidding, but he okay, wouldn't fight yeah. him. He's, he's a Crush. solid man. Yeah. I like Crush. He's a great guy. But um, uh, those those wars we had. It was the year you guys, you know, you lost in the final that year, and then you they won the next year. Um, but like it was wars, Philly, Pittsburgh, Crosby dealing with the things he dealt with. Isn't what like Kucherov, it, yeah, Kucherov dealt with a lot this, this past, you know, playoffs, like he got beat up, but Crosby would get literally beat up. I mean, guys would get away with doing whatever they wanted on Sid and call it what you want. Obi and I talk about Sid being 
our generational, you know, player um, where, where he got beat up. It was like he had to deal with men trying to, you know, he's taking food off their tables and he's making them look like fucking like they can't skate every time he steps on the ice <laughs> and, and they would take take advantage of him. And um, I just love, man, your job that you did, you were you played tough, but you could score. You did it all. Uh, I fucking laid out Jordan Stahl. We played on missing curfew. I lay out Jordan Stahl game three, cause a brawl. Derek Patrick the grabs. Great. Yeah. End of the game. We're up, but I'm like, fuck, I think I got to send a message. Yeah. Loop, loops. What do you think? Should I send a message here? <laughs> yeah. Fuck it up. Dog. Go for it. <laughs> and you, you grab Hatcher. And it's like, I mean, it's full on, but yeah. Did you enjoy the role? Like, cause I mean, your, your team was a Colby Armstrong. You guys had such a good team. Like, I mean, it was just fun to go to war against you guys. It was just, it was, it was every night was a blast. Yeah. I mean, every night, like I said, those teams, uh, those battles, like I didn't realize, obviously we knew we, you know, hate each other on the ice and we we're, you know, laying it all on the line. And then I think my first year in camp, we played in Philly. I'm like, Oh, this is my favorite barn put up like 2000 bucks. We win. We come out. There's like no one's throwing beer on us or talking <laughs> shit, you know, sort of from Tampa now have a different Jersey on. I'm like, fuck, this isn't how I remember it at all. You know? <laughs> but in Pittsburgh, you know, they're in your face. Even when the bus is pulling up, they're hanging over that railing up top, throwing shit on you, like, you know, hanging the jerseys down or whatever. And, uh, yeah, those battles are, are great. I think, um, you know, my first few years in the league, I uh, didn't nearly fight as much. And my dad was always like, you know, just show up for the fight. That's all that matters if you drop your gloves. And I remember showing up for a few. And Mike Rupp, I specifically remember, I punched me once. It's put me down here, here, and here for like 50 <laughs> zippers. And I'm like, Dad, I don't think I'm helping the guys that much. So maybe I should go learn to fight. But uh, so I remember that one year. Uh, and it's funny because Witt even talks about it. He's like, uh, he, Witt gives Sid a suicide pass. Brendan Witt, or yeah, Brendan Witt, I think from the Islanders hits yeah. him. And then uh, Witt's coming in, our Ryan Whitney's coming in, and then I'm coming in. I go, no, wait, 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 I got this. I've been practicing all summer for this. I got this. I got this. <laughs> so, like, so I think having sit there made me, I mean, I definitely realized I wasn't going to play the power play on the half wall anymore. So I better go to the front of the net and go to those dirty areas and do whatever I could, you know, stay on the team and keep going over the boards. Because, uh, yeah. you know, like I said, He's an easy, uh, all the guys we talked about are easy guys to go to bat for. Um, and you do anything for any of those guys at any time, even, even after our careers are over. That's why I keep talking about the brotherhood. Um, it's really special. And, but yeah, those, I'm in mean, the Pittsburgh arena. I kind of touched on before, like me and my brother used to play hide and go seek in there after practice. My dad, we'd skip school, go watch the Penguins practice. My dad was in, uh, down below with Craig Patrick. Um, and we, we just run around, we go on the ice. That was our like second home. So, I mean, I put a dead mouse in uh wit shoe that we found in the mouse trap. <laughs> <and it was, laughs> so, but yeah, that smell and the character of the whole place, uh, it was, uh, it was something special. Cause I remember even going on college visits to like Michigan, Michigan state or BC, BU and the, the gyms and everything are I'm like, Dad, this stuff's nicer than the penguin stuff. Like, <laughs> the, they want more money. I'm like, I'm like, I can't go. To, I mean, I need to go to you know somewhere. This is crazy. How this is nicer than the penguin stuff. <laughs> but uh, you end up picking St. Cloud, another character school. But uh, you know, it, it was a special place, and uh, those battles with Philly is just uh, is just awesome. So it's a, it's a great uh, battle in uh, PA for sure. Bugsy, I get that it's a different era when you played in now, but do you like where the game is heading or do you want it to kind of be like how it was this playoffs where you could get away with the fucking cross checks and the slashing? It just almost seemed like it was more of like an old school atmosphere this playoffs than it ever has been before. And I have no idea if that was because of the bubble and teams just fucking hated each other this year. But do you like where the game's heading or do you kind of want it to stay with that toughness? Yeah, I mean, you you have you have to. I mean, that's where everyone talks about people. That's where the fans. I don't think understand the players will always vote on fight and always vote to keep it because once you take it out, it turns into college, and then you have some you know little guys running around trying to end your career just to yeah. make a name for himself. Unfortunately, if you look at Sid and his career, if you know they had Reeves there for a little bit and have let him go, but if they had you know someone around all the time for him, he'd probably have a few less concussions, a little more space. Um, 
you know, and unfortunately you see Tom Wilson, hey man, I think anyone on all teams would take him on the team because he can yeah. do everything. Um, and he makes some great plays as well. But, um, you know, he's, you know, he's, he's, he's not really afraid of too many guys because there's not too many guys left. So, I mean, you want to see it competitive and battling, but you don't want to see guys get hurt. And I think you're going to hurt seeing guys get hurt because guys are getting bigger and faster. And then that's where people, you know, kind of understand the code of fighting. But it's like the, the fighting's there just to make sure people don't do cheap shots or try to hurt someone from behind or a slew foot, like a dirty play, you know? Yeah. I've got clean hit guys are okay with that and get up with that. Hey, you know, guys can shake it off, but if it's all that stuff that crosses the line, you know, that stuff should be handled, you know, appropriately. And, you know, giving a guy a fine or a two minute penalty is like, Oh, well, that's fine. The series is over or this game's over. I'm going to get them next game anyway. So I might as well get my licks in now. I mean, that's, you know, so I, I mean, we love to see the battle and, and the fights, but, uh, I think you got to keep it around for it to, to help please itself and for the safety of the guys, you know, but for that's the one sport. What's the one sport you can drop your gloves and fight each other. Hockey. I mean, let's embrace it a little more. Maybe. Yeah. Don't pump those guys up for a more. Like, <laughs> these guys are important. They might not play 20 minutes and score these fancy goals, but they're just as important to those. You ask Wayne Gretzky who he wants on his team. I'm sure he's going to pick one Marty McSurley or you know, yep. somebody. Great answer. Them, you know, you know, I think all those guys, uh, you know, want uh, someone there to help protect him because I mean, Sid's willing to fight, and he, he shouldn't have to. He should never have to fight. Those guys are all willing to fight, and that's why they, they end up winning because they're willing to really. Okay, you want to throw down? We'll throw down. We're fighting for the Stanley Cup. I mean, that's worth it. So <laughs> that's my take on it. I, you know, Bugs, yeah. you're, I couldn't agree with you more. Great. And the, well, go ahead, Broadway. You got one more? No, no. I'm saying that was that was a great answer. That yeah, was fucking, that was awesome. I agree, and bro. Uh, I, Bugsy, I want to get your thought. They're gonna, they're gonna, the NHL is gonna look into the cross checks. They want to lock it down. They want to get rid of the cross checks. Did you think this playoff there was too many cross checks out there? Because I think it's a slippery slope, Bugsy. If you take cross checks out of the game like they did when hooking when we were playing boys, that you can't even do that. Like in front of the net, Bugsy, guys are just gonna go there and park park in front and never get moved. You still need those battles, in my opinion, Bugsy. Yeah, you, you got to box out. I mean, I remember the first year at the hooking, I think Sergey Goncher had over 100 PIMS, and he never got a 10 or a fight. I mean, he was <laughs> parallel to the athletes, a hook master. That was just his habit um, of, you know, from those career he played. And, um, yeah, I think for that, you know, with the cross checks in front, you have to box out kind of like basketball, right? But so you should be able to have – your, you know, your arms be able to go straight. I know lacrosse, you can like kind of do this and push, but in hockey, you should, I mean, you have to be able to be able to box out. And I can see if you're giving a huge push to the top of the guy's back and your or back of his neck, obviously that's dangerous. But if you're pushing him on the pants or in the lower mid back, maybe that way you can try to box him out. Um, because as we know, to score on these good goalies nowadays, I mean, you got to take away their eyes and, I think you, 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 you know, you have to, that's just a hard area to go to. So yes, if you go to the front of that, you're gonna have to take some cross checks. That's just the way the game should be played. Hey, you you make, you make money standing in the fucking blue paint. Ask, ask anyone. Let that's got to go there sooner. Yeah. Lupul used to say, Hey, watch Rick Nash right now. He's scoring 40 a year right now. All he does is stand in front of the net. Like I think we just ought to go there and we're going to start scoring goals. And then that, I mean, buddy, uh, goals are better than assists, and I don't care what you say. It's nice to be able to dish the puck, but you put the biscuit in the net, you get the paychecks. And that's, I mean, I think we learned that at a young age. But more more importantly than ever, uh, it, net front presence is is important to winning, man. Like, look at like, Kalorn and standing in front of the net. Like, you need a guy that's just, like, willing to take a biscuit right in the nuts or take one in the side of the shoulder uh, to score goals. It's just, it's... It's a it it's not a dying breed, but it it wins and it gets you paid, and we all like money. Woo. Yeah, it's true. Like money <laughs> and, and beer. beer. <laughs> and beer. Bugsy, you're still a you're you're a you're a green, guy, green so You're an Irish. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a, Bugsy, I'm a you, guy. Well, I figured today was a good day. No, totally, like, every day is a good day when you got a Guinness on there. Hey, Bugsy, your your rookie year, you played with uh, Mark Bergevin for I, I think he was on the team for like 50 games, whatever it was. What type of guy was he? 
because he seems oh. like he's one of these unbelievable guys to play for. Like his celebrations, watching him after the Montreal Canadiens score a goal winning game, I was like, this is fucking unbelievable. I only got him as like an assistant GM in Chicago when he called me fat because I think I weighed the same weight <laughs> that, that I do right now. So he put me on a pretty good diet, but I was like, fuck, this guy seems like a good time. It, it was great. And actually, I, I didn't know this, but talking to them, uh, him and Mario grew up together and you play on Mario's line like in juniors. So I think, you know, that year was my first year in the league with like Orpic, Army, Wit, yeah. uh, or Wit that might not have been there yet. But um, yeah, he was a beauty. I mean, it was disco in the music or in the locker room <laughs> all, all the time, disco. Um, and, and at the bar, at, you know, restaurants at dinner, he always had like these little jokes or he put his glasses on crooked. And I still <laughs> use some of his like moves. He always like points to the, you know, the, the wait, uh, waitress will come over, look at the menu. And it'll be like, it'll say roasted duck, you know? So he'd be like, what does that say? And she'd be like, roasted duck. He'd be like, <laughs> <laughs> well, like duck out of the way, like uh, a huge uh, duck. My wife hates it when I do that now. At the table, but, uh, stealing that. Um, I am stealing just, that. Like, it <laughs> all these stupid, uh, you know, just funny things. He kept it light. Like, obviously, he loves hockey, right? I and mean, that's what I think, like I said, we all have in common. And even some of the games he wasn't playing, Sometimes I think we're in Buffalo. He got like the mascot uniform on somehow. So we're going out to warm. He started like high five guys and they started like pushing guys on the way out. We're like, what the fuck is this mascot doing? And he takes it off. And it's, and it's version, you know? Unbelievable. So, I mean, he's, he's a great guy. And yes, he, I mean, like I said, he deserves all the credit for putting that team together. Um, he likes to keep it loose. He understands all the pressure, I'm sure, especially in Montreal, those guys are feeling. So he's like, hey, man, this is this is your playing a game. I right? remember that. It's just a game. Yeah, yeah. And we're lucky to get paid to do it. So, I mean, he always had the, just the best and positive attitude. Um, that first year in the league, I think we finished maybe dead last. And I would trade that in for a Stanley Cup year. But that was a special team with a lot of uh, – Older guys, Kelly Buckerberger was my roommate. That's back when we had roommates Bucky. Um, back in the day. So Kelly Buckberger was my roommate, and uh, he definitely showed me the ropes. So it was uh, a great <laughs> time for sure. <laughs> Bugsy, man, you were one of my favorite teammates, buddy. I know we only had two months together, and you know what? It was probably good that we did, right? It was probably good that we only had two months together, brother. But I've said to Updog and Broadway on this show, listen, we've all played guilty. If I had one vote for the best guilty hockey player I've ever played with, it's you, brother. But the one story I think about Bugsy, it helped me out with this. Remember the preseason game in New York before I fly to Prague? <laughs> <laughs> so, boys. We rolled the dice. So, we boys. Dice that night. Me and Bugsy. Bugsy just signed a huge... We didn't huge, think we were playing. We didn't think we were playing. We just played like two or three exhibition games in a row. So, we're like, we're, we get off the plane. In we a go row. To, in a row. So, we go to Razor. The, the, the equipment guy were like, Razor, we're not playing anymore, right? It's an afternoon game at MSG. We're flying to Prague. He's like, no, it's not any real veterans. It's just the young guys. We're like, all right, fucking right. So we're not playing, Bugsy. So me, Bugsy, Mike Smith, and Vinny LeCavier, we go out for dinner, and then <laughs> they go home a little bit earlier. Me and Bugsy, we stay out, eh, Bugsy? Remember? <laughs> 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 and we, and the bucket on my head <laughs> <laughs> and we get uh, I get I wake up me and Bugsy we get home no lie boys probably 7 in the morning Bugsy no lie like we we we, we thought we were I'm playing. not a big time guy <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah yeah I'm trying to get used to European time zones yeah <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> so I wake up to but a New York I wake up to a text, hey, Bugsy, I wake up to a text from Mike Smith being like, you and Bugsy are in. And we're like, no. no. <laughs> so there's no pregame, there's no pregame skate because afternoon game, obviously. Bugsy, remember the pregame meal? <laughs> uh, yeah. I mean, it's a little, bit, I just remember going to the rink, same thing, seeing your name on the board. And then Mary Merrill is like, I need to talk to you. I'm like, oh, shit. It's like, all right. And we're, I mean, we're buzzing pretty good still. <laughs> And he brings me on the stands. He's like, you know, I like what you're bringing to the table last exhibition games, but I need you to be more physical. And I'm like thinking, I just got done with the playoff series. I just played two other exhibition games right before this. And now I'm, you know, I'm pretty sussed up here. I'm going to play again. <laughs> and Obi, I hope we can find this clip oh, man. of you on the ice. With Col <laughs> Obi. <laughs> Obi gets the puck in the exhibition game. We our whole team goes for a line change. <laughs> He's like at our blue line. 
He goes <laughs> behind our own net. <laughs> Time out. <laughs> Time out. <laughs> <Behind our net. laughs> oh, man. I got. I mean, he has like 30 seconds. 30. I mean, 30 seconds. To move he's, he's telling all the fans at MSG just go for a beer. I'm still going to hold on to this puck behind the net. <laughs> oh, go take a piss. The I'm ranger, just. I'm, <laughs> Oh, and the Rangers get on the ice, and he he kind of walk, and he like fans on it, and the Rangers end up like running them over, and they, end up, they might have scored. I mean, Colton R. I mean, he's he's a tough guy, but he's not a one-on-one you know, specialist. I think unfortunately they took it too that night, and then it was kind of maybe the warning sign. The lights came on from oh, up top. Buddy. Oh, oh man. Cool. Cold. No, I was still was, literally uh, fucking. I was literally I, still. I, just remember. <laughs> I was still shit faced oh, the first period, was, uh, Bugsy. I was like out there, like I'm still drunk. I'm like still drunk. <laughs> Cold Nor takes me wide, Bugsy. You, you sure it wasn't. A, you, Go ahead. You sure it wasn't an, uh, a a night game? Because I remember I think Vinny in the morning is like, "Is this what it feels like?" I'm like, "What are you talking about? <laughs> this is like it feels like to be like buzzing on the ice." I go. Yeah, I was like, are those things moving around up there? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, hey boys, Kelly Buckberger said, <laughs> no one, no one time passes. Hit the net, right? Skate hard, get off. <laughs> oh man, I was in, but it might have been a night I, I completely miss. I, I got to be honest with you, four fucking beauties or three beauties. I miss playing hungover. I miss like showing up to the rink, like looking around and all the boys being oh. like, up dog. What are, you, what are you going to be able to give us tonight? And I'm like, don't worry. I will fucking, I will muck and I will be doing some funny shit out there, but it'll be good. <laughs> hey, yeah. like, there's nothing, I mean, there's dad, nothing better. Yeah. Bugsy. So then I mean, my dad was, especially when you're in a slump and when you're in a slump, <laughs> you know, you play with a little worse. Guilty, you simplify it, you go to the net, you keep it off the glass and out. I mean, you really get basic. And a slump last 25 down. games in Boston, yeah. Bugsy. Oh, well, maybe we should drink a little more. <laughs> oh, I, had, I should have cooked with the other way. <laughs> no, but B- Bugsy, that's why you're the best guilty hockey player, bro. You kept it simple up the wall, played physical, got the puck out. I think he scored that game in MSG, too. I was like, dash three. And then Barry pulls me out. Before we jump on the plane to Prague, Barry's like, hey, Obi, come here. I'm like, yeah, what's up, Barry? He's like, what happened out there tonight? Like, I think I know what happened, but I'm like, yeah, I know. It's a tough one. Like, you know, New York City is like, I want you on this team, but just take it easy when you go to Prague. I'm like, yeah, 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 no problem. Fucking me and Bugsy go 10 straight, 10 straight. <laughs> and then finally, Marty St. Louis is like, Obi, come here. I'm like, what's up, Barry? He's like, you can't go out tonight. I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, trust me, you can't go out tonight. I'm like, and then next thing you know, Bugsy, I was out there. <laughs> but what, what were we supposed to do in Prague? We had two TV channels. We we're like, come on, we're going to go out, right, Bugsy? We're, we're spreading the love of the game, you know. We're showing the love of the game. We're just, yeah. You know. <laughs> oh, buddy, uh, I love you, man. Hey, Bugsy, oh, what? Uh, tell our listeners what you're up to now. Um, you know, you're into some cool stuff. Uh, let the boys know and our listeners know what you're into, fella. Yeah, I just um, got named a hockey ambassador for this ultimate uh, franchise fantasy sports, UFFS Sports. So it's. Um, Really about, uh, I'm sure everyone plays fantasy football or sports of some kind. Now there's a way for the athletes uh, to make some money doing that. So we're, you know, we're tying the athlete to fantasy uh, sports. Uh, um, and there's a bunch of different revenues for the athlete alone to push their brands or things they like for them to grow, uh, you know, for, for themselves and, and for their fans. So it's kind of like an ultimate uh, interaction with the fans where you get to know the athlete's full story as well. We're working with AOS Sports, AOS Sports TV, which is athletes own sports TV, television. And uh, we'll be moving with them, I think in September. Um, and that's, uh, you know, something exciting that can happen for, uh, you know, a lot of athletes to hop on board. But, you know, I think everyone gets caught up with these NFTs I mean, everyone's doing those. Those are cool. Um, but this also ties into fantasy and starting your e-digital career. So so say all of us uh, hop on board, all of us would play in this Legends League. So, you know, they use artificial intelligence based off your stats. You, you create your own digital character, just like EA Sports almost, where you create your guy and can you do whatever you want. And um, 
and uh, generate uh, yearly revenue off that. Uh, off that. So hopefully um, we'll uh, get to that next segment uh, here uh, tomorrow with you guys. Yeah, there's a touching on that, Bugsy. There's so much into the world of, of blockchain and things that are happening underneath our toes that we have no idea about. And it's nice that you're part of a group that's like sharing something with athletes. Cause I think, you know, the things we, we get overlooked in so many, in so many ways for what we, you know, for, for our names getting used or um, being part of, you know, fantasy sports. And we don't know. Um, I love the fact that you're acting on behalf of the, uh, on behalf of the players and I feel like OBI and Jimmy, like talking about this on, you know, on a podcast, we feel like we're part of the players. We represent the players. And it's nice that you're doing this on such another level, right? Like it's um, things are changing in our world, like consistently. Our kids are going to, well, what our kids will grow up and see is going to be so much different than what we grew up in, you know, and witnessed. And and we, we played video games and Sega Genesis and all this and and things are forever changing. And after, you know, seeing your guys' deck and seeing what you're doing, we're, we look forward to speaking with you and your partner on this tomorrow, uh, sharing it with our listeners. But it's, it's cool that you're acting on behalf of, of us. Oh. That's, that's special. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, truly feel blessed just with the opportunity. And just to lead in just a little bit about the hockey guys, I mean, this idea started from these guys from Saskatchewan that obviously love hockey. And, you know, it's about the athlete. That's what the whole platform is about. Not just the hockey guys, it's the football guys, athletes from all over the world. So it uh, really can be a big movement. And like I said, I'm just blessed to be the ones uh, that help spread the love around because uh, the more people that participate, the better, um, you know, it will be for everyone. So it'll be exciting here to hear uh, hear what Tony has to say. How about Bugsy, I got a question. Shirt? Oh, is that what is, is that you? That's a koala bear. Oh. Riding riding a scooter, Team <laughs> AX. Let's go, baby. Team AX. Team AX. Kyle yeah. Quincy's son. You know, Kyle Quincy, you guys play yes. like yeah, yeah. yeah, I play yes. too. Yeah. <laughs> so his son, God, I mean, God bless him, had a brain tumor. Yeah. 24 hour surgery. Everything sounds to be going great. They find out 4% of the billions of dollars for cancer research goes to kids. Only 4%. And it's, I mean, that's insane to even hear that. So they started the Team Axe Foundation. I mean, not much else you have to say after that. Yeah, no, no, yeah that was, yeah, that totally. was an incredible story. Incredible. Hey, Team Axe, baby. I, Quincy is Quincy's the man. So yeah, shout out to him and and his little guy, T Max, baby. Bugsy, I had a question with the 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 uh, like the NFT like side of this, like because I, I was kind of trying to figure out what how you get involved with the UFF fantasy sports and that NFT platform. Because I feel like my NFT would probably go for less than face value right now. So like, how do I go about like growing that brand in like using this platform to? get uh yeah i don't know try to to make money off of it how like how is that going to incorporate into fantasy sports well i know initially say um they auction off your first nft so if it sells for 20 bucks you you can buy it then if you want and hold on to it so it's like your first rookie card as you can Mm -hmm. say and then someone might come along and offer you a hundred dollars right and then you're like no i don't want to sell it okay maybe around a thousand you'd sell it for eventually or whatever and then the first one i think you would get 70 percent of that and then after that every time it would move around you're collecting i think at least over 30 percent of that but then once someone owns your nft right and then you're in the legends league uh do you play at bc or yep yeah so eventually right we're doing uh the nhl fantasy now with the current guys and we're gonna start this legends league next and then we're gonna do the american hockey league and then it's gonna go down to college. So if I own the Jimmy Hayes NFT and you're playing in a, whatever, a Florida Panthers team, and then you're playing on a BC alumni team, wherever you're used, the person holding that NFT can also actually generate some revenue too. So then that's why it's like even the fans now can make some money too. So it's the ultimate interaction between the fans and the, and the player. So I think that's how 
eventually the more guys that come on board, obviously just named that uh, right now they're focusing more on uh, the football side because that's there's a big announcement coming here in July. They're auctioning off the franchises. I know they have Chris Carter as the ambassador. They just signed Michael Vick, uh, Justin Hill with the Ravens. To Tristan Jackson with the Rams, a wide receiver. There's some guys are just starting to come on board, but uh, those are just the football guys. We have some boxers and some MMA guys. And, you know, like I said, it's for athletes everywhere, but the NFTs then can go a little bit to whoever owns it and then to you ultimately too. So you're not getting, I think the NBA just sold $5 million of NFTs. Yeah. Did the players see any of that? No, that's like part of the sign the contract, yeah. right? You kind of just ship it away. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, that's like here's um here's your old peachy. We always do this, the cards. Here's five thousand bucks. Sign two hundred white tags or no throwing cards, and you, that's all you get. You know, so this yeah. is just like a song on the radio, baby. This is like Guns N' Roses. That <laughs> you walk <laughs> into the jungle whenever he dies, his kids and whoever else he writes it off to is going to be making money. So once you start this e digital career. You know, unless the internet uh, is going to go out of business or e-gaming might go out of business. I mean, it, the chances are looking pretty good. And the the what makes me feel even like the blessed, I think, is just Tony came up with the idea of, you know, Seattle just had to pay the NHL $750 million just for a chance to come into the league. And then they had to pay, what, $2.2 billion, whatever. So now I was lucky enough to own, I bought a franchise uh, with uh, the UFHL, which is the Ultimate Fantasy Hockey League. So now I have uh, a whole staff, like a real GM. I was making trades and trying to get some of my guys. So now when I come up with my design and logo, I can go to my guys on my team and whoever signed up on the platform can also make up revenue off that. They can split the 30% of the revenue just for being on my team. And then if our fantasy team wins the league, then we all split the spot again, put the, split the pot again. Um, so there's <laughs> other ways to continually to make money. And as I said, the, the legends league is where all the retired guys can play. And then there'll be different levels. Cause just like my dad, I mentioned, well, how's my dad going to make money? You know, he played 12 years in the NHL who's going to uh, buy his stuff, whatever, but they might do like a seventies, right. Eighties, nineties, because this whole start story started with Dave Schultz in Saskatchewan, their local kind of living legend, and saw how he is right now. You know, mentally not well, not really doing. Uh, doesn't have any money, and he's just like this. You know, this isn't right. You know, the players look what they sacrifice, and I think a lot of us that retire, you know, we wake up, roll out of bed, and snap, snap, crackle, pop. You know, the body. Yeah. You know, the fans kind of understand that. They're like, oh, you made millions of dollars, so you should be fine. But your mental health and uh, your body, uh, when you lay it on the line for everyone, you, you deserve uh, a reward. So, you know, it's just, it's, just, it's just out of love, giving back to the athlete, and that's where the power belongs. So I'm just happy to be on here with you guys, and thank you for the opportunity to, to help uh, spread the love. Yeah, Bugsy, our, man. Thank our you. pleasure. Yeah, man. Thanks for joining us. We'll bring your boss, Tony, on here next. But, man, everyone that played with you, buddy, they loved you. You played the game the right way. You enjoyed coming to the barn. You had fun. Um, you're an absolute beauty, buddy. We appreciate you coming on, and we'll bring your buddy Tony or your boss, Tony, on next year, Bugsy. But but thank you for joining us, buddy. We've wanted to have you on for a long time. Uh, I miss that smile, fella. You're an absolute beauty. Yeah. yeah. We're going to do it again in person. I'm going to give you guys a big hug soon. <laughs> All right, buddy. Welcome back to Missing Curfew. Uh, Bugsy, we just got into, you know, life after hockey and what you're doing, and now we got two of the boys that are leading the charge. Uh, introduce them to our listeners. Yeah, we got Tony, uh, the head honcho here at uh, UFFS Sports uh, that came up with the idea, and he surrounded himself with some great people and partners. And Nick here at AOS Sports, uh, athlete-owned sports uh, TV. Um, uh, his first class. So I'm just happy to uh, introduce these guys and you guys and just kind of let everyone get to know them and hear uh, kind of the plan and understand uh, what uh, this is about. Appreciate it. Yeah, sure. I can give a quick overview about what we're doing and uh, why we brought Ryan on and, and what our what our goal is and the plan is. Um, I started a, a 
blockchain company about uh, two years ago with nine other founders. Um, and the intent was to build a uh, NFT uh, project um, with uh, fantasy sports and sports in general. Um, we were doing NFTs before they were even anybody knew about them in sports. And uh, we were fortunate we launched our platform this spring. And by then, NFTs were the big deal in sports. And with what MBA is doing with their Top Shop program, where uh, the timing was good. So it brought a lot of light to what we're doing. Um, just a little background on myself. I'm from Saskatchewan, Canada. <clears throat> Grew up playing hockey, made it to the junior level, and then decided to be a farmer. So I've been ag in agriculture since then um, and uh, worked in different aspects from the grain side to uh, livestock side, owned uh, two different feed companies and sold those and went full time into uh, the crypto space and moved to Costa Rica here about four or five, five months ago, I guess. Um, so we've been working on this project uh, since then. Um, just a little bit about why we're different than uh, all the other NFT projects that are out there. Um, most of the NFTs out there in the space are collectibles. Um, and I think there's a uh, spot for them and, and we do collectibles as well. So, you know, what NBA is doing, what uh, Tom Brady is doing, what a bunch of different athletes are doing is just um, – making digital art of, of either themselves or, or a time in their life or a time in their career. And then they're digitizing it and then selling it on the blockchain. Um, what we're doing is a little bit different and we think a little more sustainable where we make a digital athlete NFT. So we'll do collectibles, but we make an actual digital representation of every athlete in every sport at every level in the world. And we put it on the blockchain. So that's that one holding place for you as an athlete um, that represents your statistics currently or in the past or, you know, um, to come. So that one digital uh, NFT is, is a representation of, of the athlete. And then we take that NFT and we, uh, we put it into fantasy league. So um, if it's an active player, we put it into an active fantasy sports league. But on a professional level, where it's just one of one, so if there's 32 NHL teams, there's 32 teams in our league, and it's on a professional level, and there's only one representation of each uh, each player. So that player gets drafted on a professional uh, uh, sports team, and then we play fantasy sports with it. If it's a retired uh, athlete, then uh, we use their statistics in a simulated uh, simulated league, um, and then. Uh, same thing, you know, 32 professional simulated legends uh, teams, and we use those statistics um, to, to, to run that league. Um, and the cool part about that is if the athlete signs up with us um, as an NFT, they, uh, they get paid. So half the revenue quickly that's generated by these franchises goes to the franchise owner, half goes to the athlete NFTs. So that means the, uh, the NFT owner that bought your nft profits but also the player profits um forever because so, they're always so attached that, to that yeah so let me just say so we auction off these nfts and the bid goes up and say up you have a super fan i'm sure obi has a few super fans in vancouver and tampa and they're going to bid on your nft and so the price is going to go up and then that fan or whoever owns your nft when you play in these games that fan can make money too so the fans and the player now are coming together for the ultimate kind of experience for those those fans and us to make a little coin you know that's exciting so, sorry, i just want to explain that a little more because when, when when you hear it like that i mean it's that's that's what really separates these nfts from everyone's like oh everyone's doing nfts da, 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 da. that's why you know we are different so sorry to cut you off there i felt that was a good point to drive home there yeah no that, that's a good point, Ryan. And and the thing with collectible NFTs is nobody gets paid until that NFT gets resold. So, you know, it's like when you have a hockey card when you're 15 years old and you hold on to it and, it you know, maybe it goes up in value, but you never make anything off of it until you sell it one day, which usually you don't. But if you do, you only get one payday. Whereas with this NFT, you get paid every year. Um, and, and as we get going, it'll be monthly. There'll be revenue coming in. So um, it's really about giving... Uh, <laughs> Giving uh, uh, giving athletes their brand back and a chance to make money um, off off their statistics that they're earning or have earned. Um, we kind of put it in a way where uh, 
an artist has a popular song and they get paid royalties forever, even when they're gone. Um, this is what we're doing with this platform is you're getting paid a royalty off your statistics that you earned, um, you know, forever if, if you're at that level. So, and the other important, one more point is it's just not the superstars, the big names that are important in our platform. It's everybody from the top guy to the, to the guy that gets on the ice 30 seconds in a game, because we have to fill out a full roster. Um, and we'll be doing this in the AHL and the junior leagues. So um, everybody's important. It's not just for the for the the big superstars and the big names. So I think that's important. Um, and then you know what our what our vision is for athletes um, kind of matches a lot with what Nick's doing with AO Sports and on the media side. So it was a pretty natural fit when we uh, when we met each other, and I think it just makes both of our projects stronger. So um, that's that's why we're working together. Let me yeah. ask you, uh, Nick, Nick, sorry, Tony. I just want to cut you off for, for one quick sec. I, I love the fact that you're, and we talked about this earlier, was that we're player first mentality kind of thing, taking care of each other. We're, we're a team. I think most of our listeners are probably like NFTs. What the fuck is that? Um, <laughs> you know, non-fungible tokens in, in our world now, which are stored on blockchain is a way for, for someone to own something digitally that is no other. There's just one of one. Now, yeah. um, I love the fact that you're minting someone's career, like Bugsy's career. Uh, every play he's ever made now is stored digitally. Um, his st- career statistics. What type of like, what what type of game? And do you have any partnerships with like um, like a platform? But what type of game? How was how will someone buy us three? Put us on the same line, and then play like someone else? Like what what what? T- type of what type of are they going to play on a video game is it going to be on a fantasy sports league how is this league going to be made like what type of i guess what type of platform are these people going to be playing on we, we we're all the retired guys we, we got to do a simulation right so. okay so will it be over, over like a, a tv once a week are they going to be like a scheduled game like i'm just trying to think okay we're yes someone's going to buy my you know my my token my minted fucking fantasy token. I love that. But then where are they going to play it? Like, well, what's, what's this format going to be like? So what happens is, is we, we have a 32 team legends um, auction. So we sell off 32 franchises that, that people come and buy. Um, and then those 32 franchises draft all the, all the NHL players of all time that are retired and they develop a roster. And then we will, they will play fantasy sports that's simulated um, based on your stats and, and your accomplishments. Um, ideally, and it's going off- to be a- <laughs> and our off ice skills, boys. So you know, <laughs> it might show it might show us at the bar after doing whatever. Too many we do, beers before games. What we were really good at. <laughs> yeah, not just that. Um, a character level. Level. There's a character level. <laughs> and in reality, that, that's funny, but that is something we can do anything with that digital NFT, right? We can put you in, a, in, in all kinds of games, but there'll be a professional level. And then that those NFTs really are, are, are your anchor to the digital world. So anything that happens in the digital world, even in, in 20 years, 30 years, it'll still go back to that NFT. So that way, you know, um, your family's going to get paid for somebody using your likeness or, or your statistics. So, um, yeah, that's part of it. So okay. once we draft uh, all the athletes onto these franchises, then we create a simulated league. And right now, Football will be the first one, and it will be a video game with a simulator attached. Um, and then you will be able to watch the games. It will play out an entire season as if it was real. We'll play an entire playoffs with a championship. Guys get traded. Guys, uh, you know, all the teams are branded with logos and and jerseys and, and merch. So, so we make it as legit as possible. Um, so the first year in hockey – we're still working on a nailing down a video game that has a good enough simulator um, because a lot of these video games, they're just, they're more arcade games that just play out a script. They're not um, that much of a simulation. So we have a football game that is a complete simulation and we're working on a hockey game to be up to the same level. Cool. Cool. And then Nick, where does AO sports, where does AO sports come into play? Yeah, man, we're just uh, changing the media distribution for athletes and uh, sports content creators. Uh, what we do with this is 
there's no place to really put your content, right? YouTube is a horrible monetization system. Uh, Facebook and, and Instagram and all those other platforms, you come on there, you post, you bring your network to them, and then they monetize it, make hundreds of billions of dollars, and, and you're left with the bag, right? So uh, AO Sports is just the freedom of owning your own content, but also monetizing your content. And and one thing that Tony talks about is, is being able to one day um, being able to put on a, a VR headset and actually going to the games to watch these legendary players play in these legendary games, right? How cool would that be to sit in your house and watch a, a legendary hockey game of some of the greatest players and some football game and baseball games? And, you know, you can start to answer some of these questions when you see LeBron guard Mike in a basketball game and different things like that. So, um, and, we're, and I believe we're not far off from that, but what we do is we're media distribution, um, we're really we're the production and the monetization of your content. Uh, we've we've done a great job of building out our roster. Uh, and we came across Tony, man, it was a no brainer uh, to partner up with with such a vision and, and something that could be so um, utilized by all athletes. And that gives us the ability to go out and, and create content. Content is the king of, of everything. And as you know, People have always dictated the athlete's narrative, right? It's never came from you. And then when Twitter came around, you can say something, but then you you post something and then there's 100,000 uh, comments on it and you can't even reply to it properly and it just gets misconstrued. So we want to give athletes the platform. Uh, they can create their own. We create them a channel. So you would have your own channel. It's all dedicated to you. It's branded towards you. We go out and seek you sponsorship as well, uh, where you get 75% of sponsorship. And then all your content lives Ooh. within that channel. Yeah, we, we pay out, man. We're, we're nowhere close to what YouTube, where, you know, 10,000 views on YouTube is a max, what, about $500. Uh, you bring 10,000 people yours to the platform, you're making 17000 a month. There's no limit to Hell. what you can make. You can, you know, um, you look at Messi. Messi's just signed a new deal today. He's got 216 million Instagram followers. He brings 10% to our platform. He's making $37 million a month. That's every month oh. for bringing 10% to our platform. And then we have a team revenue system where the team will share in that revenue as well because what we're doing is ultimately building a one big sports team that you're part of for life, right? Um, and that's what AO is. It's, it's athlete-owned. It's by athletes. It's for athletes and sports content creators. So, We'll be doing our own reality shows, own documentaries, uh, vlogs. We'll be doing live events um, like we're hosting the auction this week. And, and we'll be hosting the draft next month and hosting all the auctions um, through AO Sports and uh, the simulated leagues. When you're seeing that simulation, it'll be on AO Sports and UFFS's channel. Right. So you can go to their channel and be able to access that. So we'll be a monthly subscription, uh, seven dollar subscription monthly. And, um, yeah, we share that membership with our athletes and our content creators, right? It's not just views. So, Obi, it sounds like we got a new, uh, a new content creator for missing curfew wow, here to, yeah. to that's use it. for our platform. Those are some good numbers. That's it. And, <laughs> and the best part oh, is we have, we have athletes in seven different countries. So imagine all these worlds coming together. Um, that's, you know, no matter what hockey league you play on, we're talking to uh, a France basketball league. We're talking to a polo league. You know, we have boxing. We have um, two of the top 10 racquetball players in the world. We have rugby, NFL Hall of Famers, CFL Hall of Famers. So we're just bringing people that want to produce content at a high level. Um, and we just create a fun atmosphere. So the events that we do from Grey Cup, Super Bowl, uh, World Cup, um, all-star games and different things, we're just going to bring a collective group of our athletes to the table and, and just go party and have fun and, Give the fans what they ultimately want, right? Uh, great content directly from from you. And we'll have our NFL game day shows, NHL weekly shows, but ESPN is not going to own it. You're going to own it, and you're going to truly benefit from it because, you know, the networks, they buy your show from you, and then when you say something they don't like, they fire you. That doesn't happen here because we'll never own your content. You own your content, and you are the ones that drive it, Right. Lost so change, baby. That sounds amazing. Yeah, we can say fuck. <laughs> <laughs> you can say whatever you want to say. <laughs> well, not whatever. Uh, like we, we'll stay away from that one. <laughs> I like yeah. Let me but, ask, yeah, we're let me ask you this. 
On, uh, as far as like partnerships go, um, have the leagues, have you guys sat down with any of the leagues? Like I know you said NFL, you're going to start up with that. Is it more just you want just players involved, oh. athletes only? Yeah, well, for me, it's it's really the athletes, right? So we target the athletes. I call it removing the logo. Uh, they use you, they put a logo on you to bring people to the stadium, right? But it's time for us to use that logo to keep people to monetize us for life. Right. And then you don't because you'll never wear that logo forever. No matter if you're Wayne Gretzky, Michael Jordan, Bo Jackson, no matter if you're the greatest of the greats, you'll never wear a logo forever. So be able to utilize the logo that you're wearing to monetize off of for life and build that brand and build your following. So we don't really. And for and for us, like if I end up. So Warren Sapp, Warren Sapp's on board. He comes over. Warren Sapp now looks and says, if the Raiders or Tampa Bay or the NFL wants to attack somebody to take something down, well, it's Warren Sapp. He owns the show. So they have to go after their own if they want to change something. Right. Mm -hmm. So we don't own it. You own it. Right. So if you put a logo up there, you do anything. If they want to come after you for it, then you can deal with that with them and we'll help you with that. We'll support you with it. But it's really just um, the athletes from a worldwide standpoint. This yeah, sounds and, like and, something our – And from our side, when, when we started, you know, when we started, you know, we didn't know what the direction of our platform would be. We just had the concept and we, you know, we had a couple of meetings with the NHL and they, they were good because they quickly made us realize these aren't the people we want to work with. Um, they just want to, you know, take over everything and control it all. So we, we went from there to uh, talking to the players' associations – um, both in the NHL and the NFL and um, realized they move way too slow and, you know, they want a big cut of it. So we went directly to athletes and it's just been exploding from there where guys, um, guys come on board and they get their buddies on board. And then it, it just, it's just more powerful that way. Um, so we don't want to work with the leagues in any way. We want to build um, our own league with our own brands that the athletes have full uh, ability to do whatever they want with that brand and promote it in any way um, because it's actually theirs. Um, one way, you know, if, if you're playing for the Edmonton Oilers, you don't really care to uh, promote the Oilers brand. Um, well, first, they're not that great, but um, <laughs> to promote that brand, it doesn't get, doesn't, uh, uh, it doesn't uh, get you anything, right? But in our leagues, if you promote the brand that 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 uh, your fantasy brand that you're on, um, you're going to benefit as much as the the team or the league benefits. So, um, it's it's just a different angle. So, yeah, we're all about the athletes. Who's going to be the commissioner of this league, Bugsy? You got yeah. the commissioner title or what? <laughs> uh, I think I'm the president of hockey. I uh, just kind of making sure all the boys uh, are taken care of. That's all my hey, job. Just, so. just don't, just don't give us a curfew. Um, it's, just, uh, just make <laughs> beers on the bus. Eh, Bucky, no, I know. No worries. Um, yeah. How about? I mean, we should just touch on um, why you should own a franchise. I was lucky enough to buy a franchise, uh, the Dynasty in the Ultimate Fantasy Hockey League. Um, I ended up making some trades, getting a bunch of uh, guys, just like a real GM, to kind of build my team to win the Fantasy League and guys that I can help. Uh, I'm designing my hat and logo, so then I'll be able to go to these guys. Hey, if we, you know, the more we sell this, we're all, we're all going to share and can make some money. So I know the top team in the UFHL is up for sale, the Red Army team. They just won the Klein Cup, which is the fantasy uh, hockey cup. It's like a replica of the Stanley Cup, so it's pretty cool. Um, and they're, they're for sale. And I know this big, uh, you know, franchise auction for football is coming in Vegas. So Tony, maybe touch on why you should, if you can, get a group of guys together, and maybe own a team, because that's another. This is this is a business, right? You, you can make money owning a franchise with all these NFTs. Yeah, I think uh, you're still getting in early if you're buying a franchise. Like uh, Ryan's the first guy we have signed up on on the hockey side. So and there's there's a you know a bunch coming in, and with the athletes uh, actually attached to these leagues, I think it gives them a lot of value. Um, we're selling off our NFL level leagues here on Sunday in Vegas. Um, we have a big VIP event, and a bunch of ex NFLers and current NFLers will be there, and Ryan will be there, and um, ex CFLers. So you know. It's a really high-end league. It's a professional league. It's never been done before, especially attached to the athletes. So I think getting in early 
um, th- there's a chance to uh, the franchise to appreciate in value. Um, the hockey franchises that we started um, a year and a half ago, um, a lot of them sold for two hundred dollars, as we didn't have a platform or anybody attached, or you know, people stuck took a chance, and um, we've sold the last two franchises for sixty-eight thousand and seventy-eight thousand US. So um, people have made out really good um, as the concept grows. So I think there's uh, value and appreciation of the franchise, um, but also there's revenue streams that are that are going to be established that. Um, really, it really it is is going to be a business on the blockchain. Um, everything from transaction fees um, to ad revenue, because we're going to have all you guys attached to it. You know, all the athletes. So there's tons of opportunity for advertisement. Um, there's going to be revenue on the crypto side um, because all the currency, all all the transactions are done in cryptocurrency, our score token. Um, there's a bunch of fees that are collected on the the decentralized finance part of our concept. And those fees become substantial. Um, so we see those fees kind of like our TV contract because they're going to drive a lot of revenue just directly to each franchise, like as a monthly income. Um, so there's all sorts of ways that we can create revenue to this. And it's really in its infancy. So anybody buying in now, I think uh, um, you're getting in. You're getting in early. And, and just to say, he's he's also going to be getting revenue from AO Sports. So when you're driving all that fantasy talk from all the different leagues, I mean, that's another revenue stream that could be very substantial for them. But another thing that's overlooked slightly is think about the GM. Think about the scouts that's out there on the road all the time. Think about the people that really want to do this for life and these college kids that's coming up. And anybody that has those aspirations, you can now apply to do that through this fantasy league. Imagine building your own team, managing a salary cap, doing everything from a draft standpoint that they do right now. This could be the feeder league or crossover league to something that can become real life, right? Can you imagine a guy going from UFFS to the NFL or to another league and and being like, I've won this many championships and we built the team from the ground up. So this is something that really relates because there's so many elements that goes into the real game. Do guys get hurt? Cause I fucking got I hurt too much. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't want I don't want my NFT fucking with the torn ACL or you know the sore abs. I'll deal. Actually, I'll deal with the sore. League, we did I'll decide to have more. You know what? Yeah. He's got your, the board up. Is that your squad, Bugsy? Got the board. First line: Steven Stamkos, Terrence Stinko, Patch Duretti, Kilbarn. Anders Lee, Jason Zucker, Rem Pitlick, <laughs> Pitlick again, Bologoski, <laughs> Justin Falk, getting the boys, GM moves. I got to, you have to fit it under the cap, too. I got all the salary caps. You got to do it under the cap. <laughs> and, that's what, and that's what it takes to run a team, right? So I just think there's so many elements. Just imagine how hard this draft's going to be next month. 53-man draft, and you got to stay within the salary cap understanding what positions, what, like a regular person can't do this. You have to have a capologist. We we're going to purchase a team and we've already signed a sports management team of seven people, right? We have our own capologist, our own general manager, assistant general manager, office coordinator, defense coordinator, um, a scout, the scout in the league. So understanding all those elements that come into play and how you move forward, it's assimilation and it's true fantasy, but, it can really prepare you for real life and and everything that's done. And I think that's what makes it so exciting, right? From the trades to the what ifs that we can now get to get some answers to and see some cool. And for us, we're going to get great content every week. You're going to see why we're, our lineup is the way it is. And we're going to tell you who, who fucked up and and picked, put the wrong person in. And, you know, why we start this right tackle when he fucking sucks. Right. So we're going to see that uh, live on AO every week. So it's going to be good for us. I want to know the guy that's got the key code into the algorithm. That's going to do these simulations. (laughs) There's, there's Bugsy. Bugsy's got the fucking computer nerd over there. He's fucking, he's going to go, I'm getting three tonight. Watch this. Bing, bing, bing. (laughs) Fights and uh, no, that's really cool. <laughs> yeah, it's it's really cool, Obi. So, I, I guess let's just let, let's just close it by by like you know when's the draft? Uh, you know how many teams? 
the excitement where people can kind of like go, what websites to see some stuff that's going on, some updated news. Uh, just, just hit us with that, boys. Yeah, our website's uh, uffsports.com, um, and you can sign up for the the, the UFAFL, which is our, our NFL-level uh, uh, franchises. Um, the, fran- the auction is on Sunday um, in Vegas. You can uh, bid online. Um, the auction closes at uh, 1, yeah, 1 p.m. Pacific time. So the auction closes and then it extends uh, two minutes every time we get a get another bid. So it's going to be an exciting day. Um, once those franchises are sold, um, we uh, go. We, the draft will be around August twentieth. Um, we'll be doing the draft. Um, and in between there, anybody on the hockey side, the the great thing about the blockchain is the uh, the teams are always for sale. So you can go on our website and you can buy a team, a hockey team, at any time. All the hockey teams are sold and owned. But every single one of them, you can make an offer on that team at any time. It's just a click of a button. So that part's pretty cool. And, uh, yeah, starting with Ryan, we're going to be bringing on hockey players left and right. So you can buy those NFTs coming up this fall, September or so. Um, so you can buy your favorite player and, and go into business with them is what we say. Because once you buy their NFT, it's you and them. And that, that's pretty cool, I think, uh, for a lot of fans. That's awesome, boys. And you can go to aosports.tv. Um, our platform oh, yeah. will launch. Our beta oh, launch is next month. <laughs> yeah, our beta launches next month. And then our official website, I mean, our official platform will be launched in September. Um, we'll be an app on your phone, uh, be on the computer and be on TV. We'll be an app on the TV, right? So um, we're going to cover all the bases. And there's so much more that we didn't even discuss today from mentorship programs, leadership. Um, you can sell packages inside off your channel as well for skill packages and things like that. So, um, so much more to discuss, but I appreciate you guys for having me on and I look forward to future conversations. No, thanks for coming on. That was awesome. Uh, Tony, Nick, Bugsy, thanks for setting it up, boys. That's exciting. Cool stuff. Fellas, good life. Our boys got us looking sharp, feeling fresh, comfortable, all of the above. I got it on again today, boys, with the shorts. Up dog. The boys at Good Life are big time Italy fans. They sure are. I was sitting with Andrew and partner Chris this weekend, boys, watching that finals at the Euro Cup. And I know the boys said missing curfew and DraftKings had some cash on the line. So it was nice. It was I was wearing it in style, boys. One good thing, not only are they Italy fans, but one good thing about Good Life is you can just order new gear while you're on the road all the time. I'm telling you, I might not have packed enough clothes, but I ordered a nice pair of shorts, actually two pairs of shorts, a couple new Henleys, some tees, maybe even a jacket because it's been raining here on the East Coast, Jimmy Scoop. So our boys at Good Life, goodlifeclothing.com. Curfew 20 is our promo code, Jimmy Scoops. It's nice to just be able to fly online and get that thing sent to you within minutes, baby. Up dog, that is a great point because the weather here on the East Coast has been cloudy and rainy. So, you know what? It's been a little too late in the summer for me to be wearing sweatshirts, but I got the Good Life's Guy hoodie on and they got some cool fucking graphics too. So, Good Life is doing it all over here. We got the shorts, shirts. And even got the sweatshirts to keep you buzzing and looking good all summer long. So that's visit www.goodlifeclothing.com. Support the boys at Missing Curfew with promo code CURFEW20. Dress to impress, feel good, play good, drink well, folks. Up dog, Scoopsy, <laughs> Bugsy, man. Um, what a guy. I mean, I only had a short stint with him for a couple months, but an absolute legend. Everybody that played with him loves him. Um, just a big smile having a Guinness. What a beauty. I, I, I'm going to put, I don't know, Obes. You, you said, and you threw it out there, and you said it all along. You said he's the best hangover player of all time. Best I'm guilty. Gonna, I, I'm going to throw myself in that mix. Just because I've been hung titty a, f- a few times with the boys missing curfew. And maybe I didn't deliver. I didn't sign a huge, huge ticket like Bugsy did. I didn't play for the f- I didn't play for the cup in the finals ever. Uh, but the guy's a legend. 
He's he likes his he's got good flow. He likes his Guinness. I mean, you you can't complain with that. I went to a wedding one time. Went to Colby Armstrong's wedding. I think he and I just the the ties were off. They were around our head as bandanas. We were crushing <laughs> beers, having a, having a time. Um, never played with the guy, but a beauty. Uh, so thanks for him for coming on. Uh, and just good to see a guy doing things, you know, for the players, but not just like working for a team and being like a scout or whatever. I, I think it's great that a guy just goes outside his comfort zone and gets, uh, gets something going. And, you know, he's got some kids He's living in mini he's, he's firefighting. He's doing his thing. He's a guy's guy to the fullest. So thanks Bugsy for coming on. Yeah. My, my brother got to play with him. I think it was, like 10 games Bugsy's last season in, in New York and Bugsy kind of grabbed my brother, I think right at the beginning of the year and said, you know what kid, you remind me of myself when I was young. And I think he showed my brother the, the right way, how to do things and how to be a professional. Cause I think Bugsy's he's been through it all. And we didn't get to touch on the guy won a silver medal at the Olympics too. So he's been a winner and it, it, you could just, his attitude and his energy is just so contagious. Like he just was smiling the whole interview and, it was awesome. He had put a smile on my face and, you know, the guy's a legend. I never got a chance to play with him. He's a guy that I was always, I think him and Joe Thornton are the two guys in the NHL that I would love to get one year with. Yeah. He's a, he's a beauty. Um, and you said it, Bugsy, he's, I mean, Broadway, he's contagious. That's what he's like in the dressing room. He just makes it fun to go to the rink and we'll definitely have him back on uh, Broadway. We got, we got more things to, to ask Bugsy. So Bugsy, thanks again. Uh, to you boys, that that basically wraps up the NHL season. We got the expansion draft, we got free agency, and then uh, we got the off season where we'll bring some of our former teammates in and some of our other buddies. But to you boys, thank you for your hard work this year. To our listeners, thanks for putting up with us. Hopefully, we made the hockey season a little more enjoyable. Um, boys, until next week, that was missing curfew. <laughs>